Good morning and welcome to the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor for the 81st Legislative Session. Before we begin, please mute your microphones when you're not speaking to minimize the background noise and please put your phones on silent. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Hardy. Senator Lang. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Pickard. Here. Senator Scheibel. Here. Senator Settlemeyer. Here. Chair Spearman. Here. Thank you so much. Let the record show that all members are present. Today we have a hearing on Senate Bills 291, 314, and 320. I'd like to take a moment to go over some basic housekeeping items. Uh, the legislative, legislative building is closed, as you know, as a safety precaution against the spread of the infection rate of COVID-19. So the public is not here, but all committee members, staff, and everyone else will be participating either through Zoom, video conference, or by telephone. However, there are some ways that you can still participate and engage with us throughout this session. You can register to participate through NELIS, uh, where you have an opportunity to testify on a bill or provide public comment during the meeting. Submitting written, written comment to the committee email address or fax numbers listed on the agenda. You may share your opinion via the legislature's opinion application on NELIS or by viewing committee meetings online through NELIS on the legislature's YouTube channel. To register on Nellis, simply click the participate button near the committee meeting and date and fill in the information. Once your registration is submitted, you'll see a confirmation screen and you'll receive an email with a phone number and meeting ID to call at the time of the meeting. Just to note that while meeting registration is required, it does not guarantee that you will have an opportunity to speak. Uh, that's why when we get to the testimony, <clears throat> Period. I always ask people if someone has already said what you want to say, just say ditto, and that allows us to get more comments uh, on the record. I'll announce the time frame for each segment, and that is for, against, and neutral at the beginning, and would hope that you all would abide by uh, those time limits. When you're on the phone line, please pay attention. Please pay attention. Please pay attention to which bill is being considered and follow the verbal prompts provided by the BPS staff. So you know which keys to press and when to raise your hand to unmute yourself and staff will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Detailed instructions for participating in committee meetings are also available on the help page, which is linked in the banner at the top of every page on Nellis. So if you need any assistance with any of these processes or if you would like to receive electronic notification, of the committee's agenda and minutes, please contact our committee staff at the email list on the agenda. Any exhibits for the committee must be submitted in electronic format no later than 8 o'clock a.m. the day before the meeting to our committee staff. Contact may be found on the committee page on NELIS. In addition, any person proposing an amendment to a bill being heard by the committee must first talk to the sponsor. If you intend to submit an amendment, you must first talk to the sponsor and let them know that you intend to submit an amendment. I will not entertain any amendments if the bill sponsor is not aware of the amendment. The proposed amendment must be submitted in writing 24 hours prior to the meeting. So please include the bill number, a statement of intent and your contact information. When you're testifying, please remember to unmute your microphone and clearly state your name and the entity you represent at the beginning of your testimony. Speak clearly and please project your voice. If you can get as close as you can to the microphone without it biting you, do that so that people who are watching remotely can hear and understand your testimony. Remember to turn off your microphone when you finish speaking and a reminder to all of those who are testifying pursuant to Nevada Revised Statute 218E.085, it is unlawful for a person to knowingly misrepresent facts when testifying before a legislative committee. A 
person, person who knowingly does so is guilty of a misdemeanor. And the chair or any member of the committee may request a testifier to submit documentation supporting their testimony. Do committee members during these virtual meetings, when an agenda item is called for, we will do a roll call vote. When the committee secretary calls your name, please answer with a yes or no to avoid any confusion. Also, I think by now we are all familiar with the raise your hand button uh, on the Zoom link. So if you want to ask a question or need further clarification, if you will do that, um, I will make sure once I see your hand, I'll make sure to call on you. Additionally, we're approaching the first House committee passage deadline, which is April the 9th. I urge all those presenting or who have presented a bill in this committee to finalize any amendments as soon as possible. And finally, all, amend um, all exhibits received prior to the meeting will be available on Nellis Online. I'm gonna do my very best to try to hear as many bills as we can. Uh, and so that's another reason why I'm asking people to please be brief when you're um, testifying during public comment. Uh, if we have some additional time, if we can pick up some minutes during these meetings, then I can have an opportunity to put maybe one or two uh, bills on the agenda. So please be aware that we're not trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, expedite to the point of people not understanding or not getting pertinent information on the record. But uh, if there are some things that you can ask offline to help us make up some time, um, I'm sure that that would be appreciated, not only by me, but by some of the people whose bills we have not been able to schedule yet. And so with that, I'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 314. Uh, Vice Chair Neal, Brian Walker, and Alexandria Daslich, and I hope I pronounced the name correctly. It provides for the regulation of high volume marketplace sellers. Vice Chair Neal, proceed when you are ready. Good morning, um, Chair Spearman. Thank you uh, for allowing me to be here this morning as I'm on the committee um, to present SB 314. Um, as you stated, I have a co-presenter, which is Brian Walker uh, from the Retail Association, um, and he will go over the bill. I'm just gonna give an introduction. Uh, organized retail theft is roughly a $30 billion a year industry. It has a significant impact on customers and retailers. The impact that it has on customers is that it places them in the dark on who is selling them a good. This committee is very esteemed. If you understand product, product liability, um, which has been around for a really long time. In a brick and mortar store, typically there is a chain of custody um, for the good that goes from the wholesaler to the producer all the way to the retailer. In this particular environment with an organized retail theft, we don't have that same kind of um, chain of custody around the good. And so the, it leaves the consumer in the dark in regards to who is selling them the good that was stolen. It also means higher prices for consumers. And in addition, it means less sales tax and revenue for state and local governments. There is also a health and safety aspect in many cases because you can have stolen food products, pharmaceuticals and other consumables that aren't maintained under proper conditions or labeled property labeled properly that may make their way back to a consumer. I looked at the most recent data and in 2020, about 13% of the organized theft was allergy medication, 13% were pain relievers. And so when you think about uh, what, a, what a thief may do in order to take the labeling off the original packaging and then sell it, you could end up with instructions that may not be uh, what you properly need to do in order to take that medication. You could give that medication to your children. In addition, it is just creates a risk of harm within the consumer environment. And so I wanted to, when I was approached to bring this bill, I was very happy to do it because I am very interested in protecting consumers. And when we think about this bill, we need to think about this bill in two ways. Yes, it protects retail, but it also protects the consumer who is, who should know who is selling them a good and who should be a part of a chain of custody of a product 
so that they understand exactly who they got this product from. This bill is about transparency, nothing more than that. And I think it's a good first step for Nevada to move in this space where the federal government has already focused on organized retail theft. So with that being said, I will turn the presentation over to Brian Wachter of the Retail Association. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Committee on Senate, Commerce, and Labor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, Can I get word from broadcasting if that's working? Hi, this is Kayleen for broadcast. We are not seeing the screen share right now. There we go. Mr. Walker, are you going to be sharing the PowerPoint? Yeah, that's what I attempted to do. There we go. I apologize. No worries, no worries. There we go, we could see it. Thank you so much. Thank you, I apologize. Uh, thank you. So uh, I appreciate the introduction uh, from the, the vice chair uh, regarding Senate Bill 314. Uh, counterfeiting and theft uh, is a growing threat. Um, it has always been with us, uh, but with the onvent of Mr. online- Mr. So yes, sorry to interrupt, this is Kaylin with broadcast. The screen share is not popping up. So if you could go ahead and Stop the screen share one more time. We're just going to try it again. Please stand by as I double check to make sure it's going through. Okay, Mr. Wachter, we can see it now. If you can, can you full, uh, full screen the PowerPoint for us, please? Uh, mine is full screen. We are able to see your notes on the side. If you click on display settings, there should be a different option aside from display settings for a full PowerPoint view, or you could press F5. Perfect, there we go, thank you so much. I apologize, thank you broadcasting and I, I apologize, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to say that counterfeiting and theft is a growing threat. It's something that we've seen increase a lot, uh, especially as more and more folks are buying things on the internet. Um, COVID certainly increased that. There was a huge transition uh, to digital and online. And so this is something that we feel has reached uh, a critical mass. Uh, to that end, there was a federal bill introduced last week and it was a bipartisan bill from Senator Mr. Durbin Walker. and Senator- this is Kaylee with broadcast again. We are still not able to see the PowerPoint for it to go through to the broadcast. So I'm gonna have you, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop the screen share. And then if you could go ahead and cue it up again. Okay. I see the PowerPoint if that helps you. Thank you, Senator Hardy. We just have to make sure that the PowerPoint is being, um, is able to go through to the broadcast so the public can see it. I apologize, I'm not doing anything different than we didn't do earlier. Mr. Wachter, can you full screen it for us, please? I, I'm attempting.
Thank you, Mr. Wachter. You are good to proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and skip that side. So FB 314, we're really looking at the issues of consumer protection, um, creating parity uh, for Nevada businesses, um, those who are online and offline, um, as well as small and large, and then dealing with trying to find a way to um, stop the funding of criminal enterprises. Um, I think it's important to know what is organized retail crime. Um, and we have a definition. It involves the association of two or more people. Um, what it isn't, um, it's not stealing for personal use. It's not petty larceny. These are highly sophisticated criminal activities. Um, and these are our criminal rings. They know exactly where to hit, what to do. Um, they're both domestically and internationally uh, recognized. Um, and they end up funding a lot of their activity through counterfeit and stolen merchandise. Um, as a, a Senator Neal pointed out, this is a huge financial impact. Counterfeit goods themselves cost the U.S. economy half a trillion dollars, um, 3% of our annual GDP, and this is according to the FBI. In 2019, NRF found that 97% of retailers experienced organized retail crime, um, and retail shrink, which is the difference between your booked inventory and your actual uh, inventory, reached $60 billion. Um, and the Senator is absolutely right, 30 billion of that is attributable directly to organized retail crime. Um, counterfeit goods uh, being a half a trillion dollar industry um, are something we really need to focus on. Uh, what is, is at the root here is we're talking about stolen intellectual property. This could be music, digital, um, it could be handbags, it could be and a lot of times it is children's equipment, safety equipment, uh, prescription drugs. Um, in fact, clothing, footwear, watches, handbags, toys, consumer electronics, um, and media are all things that are commonly counterfeited um, in the United States coming in. Uh, what this means is that you have a larger geographical reach for those who are trying to find new products to counterfeit. Um, a company who might be small, who's trying to break into a local market, uh, might put their product online. Um, as they're trying to grow and scale that business, um, a, a criminal enterprise takes that product, manufactures it in China or in a different company or a country, does so without following safety standards. They do so without the proper uh, regulations, without the proper certificates. Uh, and new and improved manufacturing is making that very cheap and easy to do, um, especially 3D printing, uh, where you don't have to have special equipment to get some of this done. All of that is making it so that it is, it is very easy and much more broad for companies and illegal criminal enterprises to be stealing this uh, intellectual property. Uh, the top items stolen by gangs, uh, you're really looking at designer clothes, deodorant, uh, infant formula is a very large one, and it especially has to be stored um, and kept in, in very specific circumstances. And so when it's not stored that way, it can become very dangerous. Um, and so a lot of these products have huge safety liabilities uh, for our consumers. Um, in the brick and mortar world, uh, we are liable for those products. Uh, in the online world, that is not the case. Uh, counterfeit goods have a huge effect on consumers. Um, a few examples from the Department of Homeland Security, counterfeit airbags um, and their components. Um, obviously that is a huge security risk. Um, counterfeit batteries, we all have heard stories of batteries blowing up, exploding or catching fire. Um, this is largely because they are counterfeit and not subject to our, our health and safety regulations. Um, again, baby materials, they are often very expensive. Folks are looking to be price conscientious when they um, are expecting or, or have a new one. Uh, and so we find counterfeit goods um, scattered throughout um, children's and, and baby items. Uh, prescription drugs um, are a very large one. What happens here is they'll take an active ingredient, say fentanyl, um, they might crush that up, they might then coat other medication with it, other pills with it, and then attempt to resell it as the original medication. Obviously huge issues. And then counterfeit cosmetics. Um, R1, obviously applied to the skin and beauty products, those are going to cause lots of concern to consumers. When we get to stolen goods, and we're talking about these sophisticated crime organizations, um, some of you who have been with us in the legislature last session um, heard a, a presentation on this issue as well. Uh, but we are looking at folks that um, go out and they prey upon other people who might need um, a quick buck, who uh, are 
um, unemployed for, for whatever reason, um, they get these groups, they go in in teams, um, they have shopping lists based on what's selling online, based what's needed in a market, uh, what they need to fence to, to other areas. Um, they cause distractions. Um, they have lookouts. They're very knowledgeable about our theft laws. They, they are very um, adept at staying under our felony thresholds, making sure that they're not opening themselves up to um, the most amount of legal liability they could open themselves up to. And they're very knowledgeable about our company policies. Uh, our health and safety of our associates and our retail employees is first and foremost. Um, so it is standard practice that they do not confront um, these types of gangs when they're in the stores. Uh, we value them much more than the products, but it leads to a $30 billion loss. And just to put that into perspective, uh, Starbucks in 2019, their global revenue was $23 billion. Um, I could give you a local example. Uh, just last month in Reno, uh, the Lululemon stole, store had $50,000 of merchandise uh, covered, recovered, I'm sorry, by a California organized retail crime ring. Uh, when they were recovered, they had $150,000 worth of merchandise on them uh, from about 20 different companies. Uh, so this is something that is happening in Nevada. It's happening right now. Uh, and it has a lot of negative consequences for our stores um, and for our consumers. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about and how sophisticated that we are, are looking at, uh, we aren't talking about one or two products. We are talking about uh, millions of dollars worth of products. Um, and so I want to show you a video uh, from a California Police Department raid on what, uh, what exactly we're, we're talking about when we're talking about these fences um, and these retail stores. Um, you're gonna see that a lot of times uh, these products are housed in um, houses, uh, in neighborhoods in suburbia. This one was so sophisticated that it looks, I think, like a hardware store that you would walk into on the street. All of these products uh, were stolen. Um, you could recognize a lot of the exclusive brand names from a lot of national retailers and a lot of national brands. Um, and it's laid out exactly like um, a hardware store would. There's security that we find. Um, I think uh, it is also important to note, uh, the Senator mentioned we are losing uh, sales tax revenue. None of these products obviously will have their sales tax collected on those. Um, so that is diverting uh, resources away from the state. And then the state is also then having to spend resources fighting uh, the problem. Um, and so this is something that is, is widespread um, and causes a lot of, of problems for our retailers. I think you can see from the video how organized they are. They know exactly what they have in their inventories. Uh, they know exactly uh, what needs to go out when. Uh, you'll see around the corner here that there's a receiving dock uh, for their merchandise, for their teams to be able to come and drop off their product. And so when we talk about organized retail crime, we're not talking about a small problem. And like I said, it's not stealing for need. Um, it's not stealing for personal use. Um, it's stealing to be able to fund these organized uh, crime syndicates. Uh, what's being done now? Uh, there is no industry standard. Um, some marketplaces are very proactive. Um, some marketplaces um, are, are new and maybe struggling in this regard, uh, but there is nothing consistent um, that is being done on multiple platforms. Um, some of the marketplaces have instituted things that you'll find in Senate Bill 3, uh, 314, um, and they've removed two and a half million fraudulent sailor, uh, sellers from their platforms, um, six mil billion fraudulent posts, which I think illustrates how large of a problem we have that that many actions can be taken, um, and we are still running into this problem. Um, bad actors, they move from platform to platform, 
and they are very sophisticated at counterfeiting, they're very sophisticated at stealing, and they're very sophisticated at selling uh, this merchandise that they have. Um, and so they are very knowledgeable about what rules are out there, um, how to get around them, um, and how to exploit them. Uh, market conditions from a report from the Department of Homeland Security says that indeed the current incentive structure tends towards or rewarding this type of behavior more than these incentives uh, or more than these incentives help to stop such trafficking. Um, and so the current market, I mean, when you're taking a, a portion of all the sales um, on your marketplace, uh, there's an incentive to make sure that those sales are as high as possible. Um, this is a local problem. Uh, Vegas consistently ranks uh, in the top cities for organized retail crime. Um, we've been in the top 10. And so this is a problem that we're finding in Reno. This is a problem that we find in Las Vegas. Um, a lot of these marketplaces uh, use artificial intelligence and other programs uh, designed to be able to help uh, stop suspicious behavior and to root out illegal activity. And we think that they are um, a great supplement to what this bill requires, which is just basic transparency. Um, the other issue is that a lot of those AI programs um, aren't clearly defined on what they are looking for. And so that remains uh, a source of contention, just that there isn't a general understanding um, of what these programs are attempting to, to look at. The other issue that I wanna bring up on current market conditions would be how um, intellectual property conflicts are currently handled. Uh, right now they are handled by the individual businesses. So whether they are an online seller, whether they are a brick and mortar seller, it's incumbent upon that business to be able to fight when their products are counterfeited and listed for sale um, or when those products are stolen and then listed for sale. Um, it's been really described as a whack-a-mole approach. Um, our larger retailers, of course, have the bandwidth, they have the resources, they have the legal departments that they are constantly dealing with this issue. Um, but our smaller members, our mom and pop retailers, they don't. Um, they are the accounting department, the social media department, the custodian and you know the front desk staff. And so they don't have the bandwidth to be able to fight um, a lot of these issues on a one-off basis. There are tools on some marketplace to handle this, uh, but again, they aren't consistent. And so what we're looking for in SB 314 uh, really is a bottom of the line, what we expect from all of our sellers in the state of Nevada. Um, and so what we're looking for are six basic pieces of information. Um, and the bill defines what is a high value seller and then requires the marketplace to do two things. It verifies these six pieces of information um, and then it discloses some of that information uh, if it's pertinent. Uh, I think I want to be really clear here on, on the timeline, on the reporting, and how this works. So a new seller would join a marketplace. Um, thanks to the American Rescue Act, starting in 2022 on January 1st, um, all marketplaces will be required to provide their sellers a 1099K form uh, once they hit $600 in product sales. Um, so that's the first time that it will be required that the marketplace and the seller exchange information. Um, so that they can hand that off to the IRS. What SB 314 does, um, it says is once you've reached five thousand uh, dollars or or sorry uh, or two hundred transactions, uh, then you become a high volume seller, um, and then the marketplace would need to verify the information that you provided uh, was correct, um, and then this verification would happen on an annual basis so that we make sure consumers have access to the people that they are buying from. There is privacy protection built into SB 314. Uh, if you are a small business um, and you are choosing to operate your business with your personal phone number or your home address, uh, there are provisions in the bill that exclude that from being disclosed. Um, and so you're looking for your, your business name, your phone number, your business address, and your business email address. Um, there is never um, any information from your home address or your phone, your tax ID number, or your bank account information, none of that would ever be shared or disclosed. I think it's important to discuss the threshold levels. Um, so they are at uh, $5,000 um, in a 12 month or in a 12 month continuous period over 24 months. Um, you have to have 200 transactions um, 
that ex um, and then exceed five thousand dollars and this can only be a new or unused good so we're not talking about folks who resell folks who uh, might go to a garage sale or putting up items that they don't want. These are only new or unused products. Um, the threshold is per marketplace. Um, and so if a seller is on five, six, 10 different marketplaces, that threshold would, would be individual. So there is a potential that that person could have you know, $50,000 worth of product um, and still not have to report uh, who they are to any of those marketplaces. Uh, when it comes to consumer protection, uh, we believe that the appropriate question is to ask what level of activity should someone be able to conduct uh, on a marketplace to Nevada consumers anonymously. Um, and we think $5,000 um, is actually a, a, a fairly high threshold. Um, our brick and mortar stores don't have a threshold. They are required to comply with um, all of our laws on day one. Um, and so we, we believe that, that $5,000 is a fair threshold um, to be able to make sure that we're not getting folks who are maybe hobbyists, uh, but we want to protect consumers who are buying from these sellers. Uh, it's very important for consumers and businesses. We feel, especially our brick and mortar Nevada businesses, that there begins to be parity between how products are bought and sold online and how products are bought and sold um, in a brick and mortar store. Uh, Senator Nia outlined the numerous laws um, and the judicial history that goes back decades that outlined what we have to do and how we are liable for our products in our brick and mortar uh, stores. That same liability uh, is not carried over onto online marketplaces. Um, and so businesses are already at a dis disadvantage by um, investing in our community, by opening up stores, by hiring employees right here in Nevada. Um, and so this level of, of parity would really help restore um, an equal playing field between our Nevada businesses and these uh, online companies. Um, and then I believe consumers deserve parity. Um, consumers are often very confused about the products they buy online. 34% um, of parents surveyed um, said they didn't know that counterfeit toys are not always tested for safety. Um, there is nearly one in three toy purchasing parents who did not realize uh, that uh, counterfeit toys are, are prevalent um, in the toy market online. Um, and so we believe that providing parity for Nevada businesses uh, as well as consumers is paramount um, to creating a good retail marketplace. Uh, why SB 314 matters, it's going to empower consumers uh, with more data. They're gonna be able to have confidence that they know who they're buying from. If there's a problem with a, a product, Oftentimes those products don't appear for a month, two months, three months. Um, and so they deserve the peace of mind to be able to know who they're buying from ahead of time before they run into problems. Again, it brings parity between brick and mortar and online retail. It helps restore competition between Nevada businesses um, and then empowers the attorney general to hold marketplaces accountable for their role in providing products to Nevada businesses. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to go through the bill line by line. Um, if that's appropriate, or if not, I'm happy to turn it back to Senator Neal uh, for questions. It's, uh, it's, it's not my call, it's the Vice Chair's call, so however she wants to proceed, okay? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So, Mr. Walker, um, if you could just, you know, go over a couple more sections just to highlight, and then we'll open up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, Section 2, uh, pretty self-explanatory describes uh, violations of this as a deceptive trade practice. Uh, section four defines consumer product. Um, section six is where we define, or sorry, where we define uh, what a high volume seller is. Um, again, it has to be 12 continuous months in a 24 month period, um, 200 transactions uh, and $5,000 um, on new and unused products. Um, section seven defines marketplace seller. Section eight defines what a marketplace is and section nine um, delineates how uh, you need to verify the information is accurate. Um, section 10 is really where we start getting into the meat of the bill. Um, it requires a high volume seller to provide to the marketplace within uh, 48 hours. And there is an amendment um, that would take this to 48 hours. Um, and then once you hit that, you have 48 hours to provide uh, your bank information. Um, if you don't provide it straight to the marketplace, it allows you to also use a third party uh, provider that um, has a relationship with that marketplace. Um, it requires you to provide that contact information. 
Um, and then it also requires a, a photo ID. Um, there's provisions in the bill for if you're not a natural person, um, the person that is responsible pr would provide that ID. And then there's also provisions in the bill that if you do not have an ID, um, that you could also provide that verification. Um, so we've tried to take into account um, all sorts of, of scenarios. And then you would provide your tax identification number and then whether or not you sell exclusively on that marketplace or you sell and offer your products on other marketplaces. Um, section 10.2, uh, this would be the annual verification um, and it outlines the steps on, on what is required with that annual verification process. Um, section 11 uh, sub two is where we reach the disclosure statute um, and where it outlines the information that would have to be disclosed to a consumer online. Um, it also then has a reporting mechanism for how a consumer could report um, a particular um, seller. Um, and then on section 12, um, it provides transparency between uh, products that are fulfilled by marketplaces and those are, that are fulfilled by the third party sellers themselves. Um, I think it's important in section 11 sub two um, that this is where we find, uh, uh, I'm sorry, section 11 three, this is where we find what happens if you don't wanna use your personal address um, or you don't wanna use your personal phone number um, and outlines how you can go about applying um, so that those aren't disclosed. Um, and then also provides a way for a consumer to be able to access that information. Um, if that company um, chose not to disclose that information, but the marketplace feels that they haven't been responsive to a consumer, um, then that information would then be disclosed. And then I, I'm happy yeah. to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you for that, Brian. That's good. All right. We're ready for questions, Madam Chair. I think the one good thing about um, Vice Chair presenting a bill is that hard questions now fall to Senator Pickard. So I will go to him first. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, first, let me say, uh, I like the idea of this bill. Um, uh, I think it's useful and clearly this has been um, uh, well thought through, um, if only by the amount of blue I see on the page. Um, I have eight questions. Uh, I will ask three, um, if that's Thank you. all right. Um, uh, first, and I'm going to take them in order of sections, uh, just so that we can move through them quickly. Um, section six, it's uh, um, conjunctive. It's 200 more that result in 5,000, in exceeding $5,000 in sales. Why not or? Uh, because, you know, you might have somebody selling, you know, uh, 300 things at, uh, you know, $2 uh, that are unsafe or counterfeit. It's still uh, theft of IP. Or you might have four things selling for, you know, $2,500. Um, uh, and, and you're not exceeding that $5,000. Why not do that or and capture both sides of, of the problem? So Senator Neal for the record, and then I'm gonna let Brian respond because I think that's a very retail specific uh, issue, but you said lower, right? I'm not, I don't wanna be confused. You said- No, lower. it's not that, that I would lower either of those numbers as much as do a disjunctive uh, uh, you know, 200 items or exceeding 5,000. That way you capture those that are selling fewer items on your, I mean, he, the, the representation was if you have, you know, if you're on 10 different marketplaces, you can stay below the threshold uh, because the threshold is set, as he said, fairly high. So why not do a disjunctive if you're selling a lot of items, even though they're less expensive, or you're selling expensive items uh, that exceed 5,000? Why not do or? Well, that's a good question. Um, the, my understanding with well, the way I thought about this, the reason why I didn't even consider breaking it up and making it a separate category um, was because when we talked to the, the 
other online retailers who are in opposition to the bill. Um, there is such thing as a hobbyist, right, on eBay, who could be captured, who is not doing illegal activity, but they are selling, right? They're selling, my example that I used with them was, you know, they're selling pillows um, there, or on Etsy, they're selling pillows um, that they have made, and there could be 200 individuals across, you know, the region who purchased their pillows that is not categorize them as organized retail theft. So I think it's important to have some kind of combination there, but I will let Brian uh, get into the high volume marketplace seller and the rationale for retail. Um, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Brian Walker for the record with the Retail Association of Nevada. Um, to you and through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Pickard. Uh, I think we're looking for- Mr. Walker, just go direct, go direct. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I believe that we are looking for um, a level that doesn't go after the really small mom and pop retailers um, that are, are in action. Um, it is very expensive to be a retailer. Uh, you are probably going to fail in your first five years uh, in business to begin with, just off the bat. Um, and so I think there's a little recognition um, that there should be uh, in this language, a little bit of leeway for those smallest of sellers. Um, and I believe that the um, the and statement is really the industry standard from when we've been trying to um, understand nexus for economic nexus um, and for digital goods to begin with. Um, so that would be my understanding of where it came from and why we are attempting to to make sure that there is a level um, for our smallest of hobbyists um, so that they aren't run out of business and they can, you know, essentially incubate their retail shop before they, you know, expand and grow. All right, I appreciate that. I guess I was viewing this strictly from the consumer protection side and say you were selling pillows on Etsy, uh, but you're using, uh, uh, I don't know, fabric with formaldehyde and you're selling baby pillows. Um, uh, there should be some ability to connect uh, back to the seller, the manufacturer uh, uh, on a liability standpoint. But I understand this is a balance. I, I get that. Um, uh, the next question is on section nine, um, uh, specifically sub two, we're asking for a two-factor authentication method. Um, uh, why do we need a two, is a two-factor method necessary to identify the person? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Pickard. Um, my answer to that is really simple. So. When you think about NV Energy, when you log into NV Energy, to me, that is a two-factor method authentication. Um, when you go in, they you have to do your password, um, your email address, and then it sends you a code, which then goes to your smartphone that you have to verify. Same thing happens on Instagram, believe it or not. When you log in, it sends you you know, if you lose uh, your information, you get a code, or when you initially create an account, it gives you a code to then verify who you are. So um, when I researched the two, two factor verification, I mean, we've been, we've had this technology for a while. Um, there's actually um, a federal financial institutions council who kind of reviews multi-factor identification um, They've had studies since 2005, since we have advanced in significant ways. Uh, Two-factor authentication, um, you know, is the password, it's the PIN number, it could be a token device, um, but basically the, the basic part of it is it requires that a person, that, it, that there be something that you know and something that you have. So for example, my cell phone, becomes a part of the two-factor authentication. And I think that we didn't put anything in the bill that was overburdensome because we're all using it. We use it for to sign in to pay for our energy bill. So why not have it for organized retail theft for an online seller trying to have verification? All right, no, and, and I appreciate that. I, I, I don't personally think two-factor authentication is a low uh, uh, or is a high burden. Um, I just, uh, you know, particularly since we're talking about uh, people that 
maybe are beyond the Etsy or, or the, uh, the home hobbyist, but, but they're not all that sophisticated, uh, uh, particularly when we're talking about those that are trying to do this on the side as another business, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, people that don't have the resources and the education maybe to do more in a, a more formal way. Um, you know, the less, the disadvantaged, uh, uh, it, I just was curious to know if you felt that that was burdensome and it sounds like the answer is no, given all the other places that we're required to use two-factor authentication. Is, is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement. I think that a person who becomes a seller on an online marketplace, if they are struggling with the verification system that is currently happening in the state of Nevada with NB Energy and your power bill, then I think that there is some maybe additional training and mentorship that needs to happen for that business. Um, I don't think it's burdensome because it has become a part of our day-to-day -day lives to do two-factor authentication just to pay our power bill. All right, I appreciate that. And then my last question would be, I'm on, whoops, this is section 11 um, and it's uh, two and three, subs two and three, specifically three, where we're allowing businesses to step away from disclosure of their information, their business address and their, uh, uh, their telephone number if, they, if it's a residential address and they don't wanna give out their phone number. I'm thinking now from the consumer side, uh, say I have approached the seller, they haven't uh, responded to me, they haven't done what I need to do, and now I want to file suit and now I have no way to serve them. Wouldn't it make sense to, I mean, if they're in business and they're a business, now they're serious, they're, they're a high volume market seller, why not require them, if they're for high market, to disclose whatever address they have? I mean, it, 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 this, doesn't this become a burden on the consumer then who can't go back? Now they have to go through the, the marketplace who may be slow to respond um uh and and not even uh, give that information out now i can't serve them hmm. so you're you're talking about section 3a right that's correct and b it's uh, uh or i'm sorry c the telephone number uh i, I i'm just concerned that if we allow these, particularly since we're going after uh, the uh, organized crime, they're not, even if they take the risk and, and go ahead and, and start with the uh, uh, high volume marketplace designation, they're not gonna give out that information readily. I wanna be able to serve them with my complaint or at least call them. So if I might, oh, Yeah, sorry. go ahead, uh, Brian. And then I'll... Thank you. I, I would I would draw your attention to that same section sub four, uh, mm -hmm. Senator Pickard, um, and I think this was our our way of trying to answer that question: is if you have um, verified your information under section ten, and then you are now uh, essentially requesting the marketplace not to disclose uh, your personal information because it's what you're using as your business, you know, number and, and whatnot. Um, and then it says that if you then aren't, if a customer can't get a response back from that seller, um, that, that that customer can then reach out to the marketplace um, and be able to get that information. Um, and I, I understand the concern about, you know, how quickly the, the marketplace may act or not. Um, we certainly haven't shied away from, from putting requirements um, in other sections. Um, but I, I think there, there's a way to be able to make sure that we're not um, maybe disclosing personal information uh, but we also have that kind of backdoor access that allows a marketplace to connect a consumer with a, 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 a essentially a store, a company that they bought something from. Um, so right. I think section four is our attempt at, at answering that question. And I appreciate that. And it's probably more a question of where would we draw the line? And I would draw it in a, a place closer to the consumer maybe. But anyway, I just, I, I was curious to know uh, what the rationale was, so uh, I'm satisfied. And, and uh, uh, Madam Vice Chair, I'll, I've got a couple other questions I'd like to pursue, but I'll do that offline. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Thank you. Um, and now the runner up for hard questions, Senator Settlemeyer. 
<laughs> Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that compliment. Uh, of course, it's fun to have to always after answering questions for other people's bills. So now we get to have a little bit of entertaining time asking questions. I, I appreciate a lot of the amendments that went into this and a lot of the thought. I just want to make sure it gets on the record that we're only talking about new or unused products, you know, uh, dealing with 200, over 200 transactions, $5,000. And the reason I ask that is I'm myself, I actually bought a dump truck off Facebook for, you know, $6,000. But again, those type of individuals wouldn't have to apply correct. They wouldn't have to give us information uh, detail of information because it could be considered a low volume seller. I just wanted to get that on the record real quick. I will let Brian answer that one. Uh, for the record, Brian Walker is a retail association. Uh, they wouldn't be a, a, a low volume seller because of, of the amount, but uh, because it was a used dump truck, um, it would not be covered uh, under this this bill. So uh, if you were buying a brand new dump truck on, on Facebook, we might have some questions. Uh, but in, in terms of, of this bill on 314, it would not cover um, the secondary market at all. Okay, thank you for that. And then uh, an extrapolation of that, within the discussion, the bill originally indicated giving this type of information, if you became a high volume seller within 24 hours, you kind of mentioned 48, but I'm looking at the proposed amendment and it says three business days. So I assume all parties are acceptable with the concept of the three business days? I apologize. <laughs> oh. I, I'll, I'll answer this one, Brian. <laughs> Sorry. I, I changed it to three business days. Some of the opponents to the bill were trying to get us to go as far as 10 days. Um, and in order to try to find a middle ground, well, what I felt was the middle ground between 24 hours and 10 days, I selected three. Because 72 hours for you to turn around the information that's being requested, I think is, I think is, reasonable i appreciate that i agree it's with you especially long. with the concept with business days as well so i appreciate that amendment trying to address those concerns uh last, two last questions how much time will it take potentially to verify said information or do you have any concepts you know in, in other words again so you become a high volume seller and they have to verify this information how long do you think it takes to do that you think it can be turned around fairly quick or so I think that's a Brian question, but I think for, based on the verification section where it has a two-factor authentication, I think that it could it could happen fairly quickly. Um, what we found out when we were talking to a lot of the, um, online marketplaces, uh, eBay, Etsy, Poshmark, et cetera, um, that they were doing their own version of, um, I guess, I would say monitoring what the goods that were coming in. eBay had a very um, established, I guess, verification process. And what I asked them was, okay, if you're if you're doing this right, then why can't you just go ahead and codify some of that language in state law that then kind of gives that broad um, perspective, well, broad language, so that everybody kind of falls under the same thing. Um, because when I found out what they were doing internally, what I picked up from them was they just wanted to do it themselves, but they didn't want to be regulated by state statute. So it seems that they all internally have the capacity. They just didn't want to be under state law and regulated to be told how to do it. Does that make sense? So I think that yeah. they can do it fairly quickly. Okay, I appreciate that. The last question is probably more one to ask Brian about. Um, I'm always concerned with any type of bill that deals with things that are sold on the internet and the state of Nevada regulating them. How does that fit in within the concept of like the Commerce Clause? I mean, do we have some other states that have done this that we can look to as a success or is this kind of the trend the industry is going into or are we the first in this field? Just curious. Uh, Thank you, Senator Brian Walker, for the record, Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we are not the first. The bill has been introduced uh, in uh, 14 other states. Um, it just actually passed Arkansas' second house yesterday and is on its way to its, um, their governor um, as we speak. Um, so Nevada, I don't believe, will be the first uh, when we contemplate passing it uh, in late May. Um, as to the Internet Commerce Clause, I can get you um, all the information offline on how we are not violating the Interstate Commerce Clause. Uh, but this is becoming more and more of a of, of an established fact that states have 
um, the ability to regulate this type of activity, especially when it comes to protecting Nevada consumers um, on what type of businesses and interactions we allow them to have with our Nevada consumers. So I'm, I'm happy to provide all of that um, and a follow-up, Senator. Thank you, I appreciate that. And thank you for allowing me to ask questions, Madam Chair. And thank you for presenting the bill, Madam Vice Chair. I, I think it's a good bill. It does a lot of good things. I have some additional questions that we'll pull up on offline as I don't want to hog all the time. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more hands. Are there any other questions from committee members? Um, so, Madam Vice Chair, I just have a couple of questions, and um, you chalk this up to my lack of knowledge um, about all the intricacies about bills and all that. I mean, I'm not a JD, so um, this may be rather pedestrian. First of all, um, in 2019, I know Senator Scheibel had a bill that dealt with um, cosmetics, and I think it was experimenting on animals or using animals for experimentation and developing cosmetics. And, and that was really um, a safety issue, um, consumer safety issue that could have had, that could have uh, some very serious ram ramifications. I know that that's not mentioned particularly, but I think Mr. Uh, Walker mentioned uh, cosmetics as one of the um, items that could be sell sold online and could um, have negative consequences for those who purchase it. Is that too convoluted? Is is there anything in this bill that would go back to the bill that uh, Senator Scheibel had in terms of, of cosmetics? Or is it just, no, we just have to look at it from the um, counterfeit statute? So thank you for the question, Senator Spearman. I, I, I don't see the, cor the correlation between the two. I remember Senator Scheibel's bill. I thought it focused on use testing of animals in order to create a cosmetic product. And I guess, wait a minute, I guess there could be a correlation if you're, if, if the argument is that a organized retail thefter, that's what I'm calling them, decided that they were going to do a counterfeit product where meaning that they created a cosmetic and then they used animals to create it and then put it on the marketplace. Um, I think that that would be the very narrow caveat and that would be something that I think Mr. Walker would have to break down. Has, has the counterfeiting come to the, to the point where we're not just taking Revlon and L'Oreal off the shelf and uh, repackaging it? Um, are, are they, is the counterfeit to the point where they are trying to reproduce and recreate the cosmetic product and then sell it as their own because that gets into the intellectual property piece that uh, Mr. Walker spoke about. But I don't know if it gets to that level of uh, detail. Mr. Walker? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, uh, and to you, uh, Madam Chair, for the question. Uh, yes, um, we have gotten that sophisticated. Um, and so how this bill would, would affect um, Senator Scheibel's bill from last session, I think is exactly how the Senator orchestrated is if Nevada can say, we don't want these products tested on animals. We don't want them to include any of these chemicals. We don't want them to do this. We need them to be X amount of safe. Um, those who are counterfeiting those products are not going to follow Senator Scheibel's bill or any other safety regulation or requirement. Um, and so those products, you would not know whether or not they were tested on animals. You would not maybe know what is inside those products. Um, and so that is something that is, is very concerning um, to, to people who are buying those kinds of products. Um, there's, there's a huge direct health correlation between those two. Yeah, and, and thank you, Mr. Walker. And that was my, I guess that was my concern because everybody uh, doesn't have the same law that we passed last session about, about that. And then there are people who have certain allergies, et cetera, to um, that sort of, um, testing and then putting that into cosmetics. So thanks for that. The other thing that I wanted to ask, um, in 2022, Mr. Walter, you said that the everyone will have to go through this and there's a $5,000 $5, threshold and we're starting with 650. Uh, so what happens if the federal, and I may have just asked, answered the question, the federal statute will say 5,000, but we're saying 650. 
So will it go up to 5,000 or will we stay at 650? Um, thank you, Senator Brian Walker with the Retail Association to clarify. Um, so the federal uh, new rule that was uh, put into the American Rescue Plan and goes into effect um, January of 22 is $600. Um, and so at that at that level is when um, that 1099 would be required to be furnished. Uh, what 314 does is require, uh, we say when you hit a $5,000 threshold, we consider you to be a high volume seller. And then that's where we ask the marketplace to verify your information. So um, ideally, if you're following the rules beginning next January at that 600 level, you, you would have already had to have exchanged this information. Um, and so 314 would then just require the additional verification after you become a high volume seller, um, you know, the difference between that 600 and that 5,000. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Walker, you also mentioned something about the small mom and pop businesses. And so that, that is a concern of mine because I know that during the pandemic, a lot of the mom and pop businesses were not able to hang on. And, um, it's deeply troubling that many of those mom and pop stores were um, owned by members of the BIPOC community, black, indigenous, and people of color. So if this theft, um, and I, I'm calling it that for short, if this theft is affecting small businesses, do you have any idea or had you thought about what does that look like for, for the BIPOC, small BIPOC business persons who are barely hanging on, and those who may have um, may have have um, gone out of business, and, and and maybe there's not a, maybe there's not a, a a direct line from their business failure to what we're talking about here, but but I'd be curious to note because a lot of times what what affects um, businesses owned by uh, members of the majority culture, if they catch a cold, small BIPOC businesses get pneumonia. And so I'm interested in trying to figure out how, if that has affected or could that have affected their success rate? Just curious, I don't know. So, so Mr. Walker, can, can I take a stab at this one? Please, madam. Um, so I don't have the data, but I'll, I'll give you a specific example as to what you are referring to. So one of my Nevada Grow businesses, which I've had a small business uh, program that has passed through the legislature since 2015. And I have a beauty supply uh, warehouse store owned by a uh, black woman in my district. Um, it's called Candies. And so, and she sells hair, um, shampoo, et cetera, beauty products. So, so in that example, if she was to get her product stolen and taken from her, it would be a direct effect on number one, her inventory and her inventory costs. On average, she puts out about $5,000 a month just to keep her doors open. So when she loses uh, products that were stolen off of her shelf, she has to then replace that because part of, the, part of the part of her story is being able to number one, have full shelves, right? So you can compete with the beauty supply warehouse down the street. Um, she needs to have a range of products that uh, the customer wants to buy. So when those things are taken from her, she has to replace that loss, right? Then she also has to go through the process, if, if possible, to identify or seek a court remedy if she finds out who it was that stole the items that's um, selling it on Facebook or whatever. And so I, I do think there's a direct relationship, but in terms of the data, maybe Mr. Walker has it, but I know that um, she has had to install a system within her store to number one, maintain uh, the products that she has. She, she is the person who runs it. She is the cashier and she is sometimes the stalker the stalker of the shelves, not the stalker, but the stalker of the shelves. And so, and so I wanted to bring that up because um, I know that that's a heavy industry where uh, theft is real around beauty products um, and, and stealing um, hair goods. 
Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Walter, I don't know if you want to respond, but people may get tired of me saying it, but Racism is a public health crisis, and the threads of racism run throughout our society in every aspect to include business. And so um, I would really like to know um, how this, um, uh, this sophisticated uh, theft ring, um, how it affects small BIPOC businesses. Uh, that's, that's really concerning to me. You know, so, and, and I'll just use this as an example of, of a major chain may be able to absorb, and I'm speaking here what uh, Vice Chair Neal just said, is they may be able to absorb $30,000 in loss or $3,000 in loss, but to a small business person, that might be that might be the difference between being able to make it through the pandemic and then having or having to close next week. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that. If there's any information that you could find um, about that, I certainly would appreciate it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Brian Walker for the record with Retail Association. I would just say, I, you know, we are looking at those small business owners and um, those, those BIPOC uh, business owners, you know, they're competing against their own products a lot of the time. Um, and so when, you know, they have their products stolen or they're counterfeited and they are posted online, you have small business owners that are competing against their own products, um, their own products that maybe weren't regulated like they were. Um, and so you have that counterfeiting issue on top of it. And then when you get to the organized retail crime, um, some of those smaller retailers, ma'am, you're absolutely right. Ten thousand dollars is the difference between um, is, is the difference between staying open. It's the difference between closing, um, and it could be the difference between having an employee or not having an employee. Um, and so when they have a lot of the deck stacked against, you know, all small retailers to begin with, um, this adds an additional level of pain hurdles. Um, and responses because to Senator Neal's point, that small business owner now needs to become a, you know, a private investigative sleuth to be able to start tracking down online where some of their products may have been posted or, or where they're being stolen. Um, and so that is all time taking away from that small business owner, you know, being able to meet their, their customers' demands and needs and wants. And so all of that makes it much more difficult and much less likely that those small businesses are going to be able to flourish into larger, you know, regional or, uh, or global retailers. Um, and that, that stops the, the, the need for success. Okay. Last question. Um, this I'll direct to Vice Chair Neal. You mentioned that the, um, the person who has a small business in your district uh, has had to do some things in order to protect um, her warehouse. Is there any way, and maybe it's the UN, Mr. Walter, but is there any way for us to, to be able to discern what the cost is of these extra steps that small business people have to go through once, once they've been robbed uh, or someone has stolen something from them, then there are some other things that they try to do, you know, to make sure that they they are uh, hardening, hardening their uh, facility so that it won't be as easy for um, thieves to break in or people to come in and steal. So I'm, I'd like to know, and maybe you can't find it, but I'd really like to know that dollar amount in terms of the small, the, 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 the supply chain, if, if the woman with the warehouse has $3,000 worth of product stolen, and she has to put in an alarm system. What does that cost? If she has to um, hire somebody, you know, um, as a guard or whatever, what does that cost? What does it cost the small business person after they have lost uh, what to a big box store is, you know, mox mix, but to them is everything. What What is the cost? If we can discern that, I'd really be interested in that. And, and quite frankly, I had not, I had not thought about that, but uh, as I said before, I'm I'm concerned about the big box stores, but I also know that BIPOC small BIPOC businesses have had a hard time holding on during the pandemic. And if this is affecting them in any way, then then I believe this it's a direct line. Uh, the vicissitudes of this is direct line right back to the systemic racism that we're trying to deconstruct this session. If that makes sense to you, it does. Thank you, Senator Spearman. Um... I know that, you know, this is the theoretical question, um, but there there is conversation that is happening between me and majority leader on the other side, Assemblywoman Benita Thompson, about doing a small impact, uh, small business impact study to try to understand how the pandemic actually affected businesses 
um, in the pandemic. Um, it is it is still theory. We were going round and round about it yesterday, trying to figure out how to create the nexus um, to tell that story and put it in language so that it is a statute that our colleagues will vote on. But I think we are thinking about that and we are contemplating that because of what happened during the pandemic. Although the, the businesses, a lot of the businesses received um, the federal assistance that came through, we still need to uh, focus on what are they doing in the pivot, right? What are they doing in the business shift? What are the new business costs that they are incurring for doing business during the pandemic and then starting to uh, become whole again, right? Because once the pandemic um, is over and the federal assistance is removed, those individuals have to then generate the revenue to become the sustaining businesses that they, that they that they want to be and so there are costs incurred with that and so if there were rev, if there were inventory loss if there were different things that they had no control over uh, because they didn't have traffic in their store or or they had more uh, uh, suspicious activity at their store because they couldn't be there then I think that these are things that we need to consider um, this is all theory um, but in terms of trying to dig out that data I think retail would be the best. And I know that there is a small business group, not to throw them out there, but I think it's, is it, Brian, is it NFIB uh, under Randy? It's Randy has a small, super small business group, right? Yes, they have. Um, Brian Walker, for the record, Retail Association of Nevada. Um, I believe you're referring to the Nevada Federation of Independent Businesses. Um, yes. They are represented by uh, Randy Thompson. Yeah, okay. So maybe that data is with her. And we'd be happy. Uh, we will do some research, Madam Chair, um, and find you the answers you're looking for. Um, I know they exist. Um, we'll put them together and, and make sure you get those. Thank you, because that, for me, that's that's huge. That that's 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 huge. And and Vice Chair Neal, you said it's it's just theory, um, but so was the Tuskegee. Uh, experiment until we found evidence. So I'm not discounting that it's theory right now, but I really would like to know what the the reason for this bill, what has been the reason, what has been the impact of that reason on small BIPOC, BIPOC businesses. Uh, and I, and I, th I think, I think we, I'd like to know it. And I think it's something that we, we should consider, you know, I mean, throughout the retail um, chain, because they're, ha they're, they're already having a small, they're already having a tough time. Anyway, um, that's real important to me. So if you could find that out, I certainly would appreciate it. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, committee members? So I just want to add, Senator Spearman, uh, we work on that, we work on that answer. Thank you for allowing the Walker to present SB 314. Um, business, businesses and their health as a business is very important to me because I feel that it is this, it is the doorway to um, personal wealth um, and it allows for the creativity of a, of a business, um, a dream to exist and be assisted. And so I know that the opponents of this bill uh, feel that this is going to hurt some small businesses, but the tenure in my legislature, in this legislature has been focused on supporting small businesses and trying to help them go to the next level. This, this bill is about transparency. This is about verifying and, and having the ability to identify who sold you that good. And if that good came from a person who stole from a store, we need to know who they are so we can have the ability to remove that product and deal with the individual who stole it. This is just the first step. And so I think there's nothing wrong with having, with identifying who sells a good on an online marketplace. And that will be my closing comments. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Um... Broadcast, uh, I think we're ready to open it up for um, public comments. We'll start with those who are in support and we'll do 15 minutes. 
three minutes per individual. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. To testify in support of SB 314, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 124, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N, with the Vegas Chamber. We appreciate the bill sponsor bringing this bill forward and working with the proponents on SB 314. The Vegas Chamber is in support of this bill. As you have heard, this bill is about parity amongst businesses, greater transparency, protecting Nevada's families and consumers from fraudulent products and goods from criminal activities. The direct financial and safety impact on consumers and retailers is a growing concern as these organized crime groups become more sophisticated in operation and scope. Counterfeit products, as you have heard today, are public safety and hazard, and hazard uh, health hazard for Nevada's families. The reality is or organized crime neg negatively impacts both employers and consumers, large and small businesses. It's for these reasons we ask you to support SB 314. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 580. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Dillon, J-O-H-N-D-I-L-L-O-N, -L -L -O and I'm the Home Depot's manager of state and local government relations for the Western Division. The Home Depot is the world's largest home improvement retailer, employing nearly 4,000 associates at 22 facilities in the state of Nevada. On behalf of those 4,000 Nevadans, I come here today to testify in support of SB 314. The goal of this legislation is to give consumers a fighting chance by equipping them with the information they need to make safe and legitimate purchases on online marketplaces while deterring bad actors who seek anonymity through increased transparency requirements. One of the reasons Home Depot sees the need for this legislation is the growth of organized retail crime, or ORC. ORC is the theft of merchandise with the intent to resell. To be clear, though, ORC is not petty shoplifting. This is theft for greed, not theft for need. A typical ORC ring begins with a white-collar criminal who devises a way to turn products into cash, or what we refer to as fencing. This fence then recruits individuals to steal on their behalf, oftentimes preying upon vulnerable populations, such as the homeless and individuals afflicted by drug addiction. They'll pay them a de minimis amount, or they make hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars in these schemes. Increasingly, these stolen goods are being resold on unregulated online marketplaces. A 2020 study by the National Retail Federation found 59% of stolen merchandise, credit, and gift cards were being resold online. That represented, represents an eight-point increase over 2019. Um, just in closing, we do not seek to tighten laws with respect to petty theft, including theft by individuals acting under the direction of organized crime leaders. Rather, we see value in proposals like SD314 that create common sense and pro-consumer policies. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Thank you for your time today, and I respectfully ask for a favorable report on SB 314. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 342. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Bailey Bordelin with the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. We just want to thank Senator Neal for bringing this bill. We see it as an important consumer protection issue that will assist both Nevada consumers and Nevada small business owners. So thank you, Senator, and we just wanted to put our support on the record. Thank you, caller. Currently, we are taking support on SB 314. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 496. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Alexandria Daglich, D-A-V-L-I-C-H. 
and I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Nevada Restaurant Association. We echo the comments made by our colleagues and urge you to support the passage of SB 314. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 781. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Nick Vanderpool, N-I-C-K-V-A-N-D-E-R-P-O-E-L with Capital Partners today representing the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce here today to support Senate Bill 314. Senate Bill 314 provides much needed safeguards to Nevada, both consumer and small businesses. Um, I reiterate what, what many of my colleagues already said, so we appreciate Senator Neal for this legislation and urge your support. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Thank you, caller. Chair, you have no more callers left in support at this time. And okay, we'll move now to those in opposition. Uh, 15 minutes, three minutes per. Thank you. To testify in opposition of SB 314, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 880. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Mike Shutley, S-H-U-T-L-E-Y, uh, Senior Manager of Public Policy at Amazon. We're proud to say that we've invested nearly $4 billion in Nevada since 2010, and we've created more than 21,000 jobs. There are more than 19,000 small and medium business sellers in Nevada growing their businesses with Amazon. Amazon shares the goal of holding bad actors accountable while also protecting consumers and honest entrepreneurs. However, SB 314 is not the right approach to fighting organized retail crime. Amazon is committed to preventing all forms of fraud and abuse from harming our customers. We have the processes, technology, and teams in place to protect our customers by preventing counterfeits, unsafe products, and otherwise fraudulent activity before it occurs. In 2019 alone, we invested more than $500 million and dedicated 8,000 employees to this effort. Our seller verification system analyzes hundreds of unique data points to verify a prospective seller's information and identify potential risks, including looking at the seller's IP address to determine whether they are using a private network to hide their location. We also connect with the person one-on-one -on -one through live video chat. Once a selling partner is verified, we consistently monitor accounts and require additional documentation to list certain products. Unfortunately, this legislation will hurt honest small businesses by setting up roadblocks for legitimate sellers. The bill's verification requirements are ineffective and will not stop criminals who by definition will ignore the law. However, a legitimate seller would be suspended from conducting business if they are unable to gather the materials required by this legislation or if they fail to merely tell Amazon their info has not changed within the bill's stipulated timeframe. The seller verification process in this legislation creates more bureaucracy, not more transparency. Additionally, displaying more personal information like an email address or a phone number of a seller does not help consumers make more informed shopping decisions. Instead, the bill entices consumers to initiate offline, unmonitored communications that could expose them to fraud and abuse. In order to prevent this abuse, Amazon has specifically tailored tools to best protect our customers and selling partners by minimizing unmonitored communication channels. Ultimately, this bill won't stop the bad actors. This legislation is not the right approach to fighting organized retail crime. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller, um, broadcast, has he, has he hung up already? Uh, no, he has not. Okay. Uh, so, so thank you, um, and um, I've, I've probably purchased enough from Amazon for you, so you all can hire at least 10 additional employees uh, just in the last year or so. But, I, I, you know, first of all, I want to applaud your, your efforts um, in terms of trying to make sure that the, the bad actors are kept out. But um, I want to ask you the same question that I asked um, Vice Chair Neal and Mr. Walker. Uh, I am interested in knowing how... If this legislation does not pass, how will that impact the small BIPOC businesses? Don't answer that yet. Uh, and I'm happy to take a call afterwards to um, find out. And you mentioned you mentioned it will set up roadblocks. So um, tell me what those roadblocks look like and how those roadblocks 
um, might intensify negative effects on BIPOC, small BIPOC businesses. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, to answer your first question, I would like to follow up with you after this hearing. We can talk more about how we can you know, get that information to you on BIPOC businesses. Um, as far as the roadblocks that I think we feel this, this creates, this, this uh, ineffective framework of documentation that really won't stop the bad actors. But instead, if a uh, seller uh, who is using uh, Amazon cannot uh, provide this information quickly or just inform us of it, it can um, inadvertently kick them offline uh, until they can comply. Um, secondly, there was some discussion about um, the information that's posted and allowing for small businesses not to uh, post their personal information. We think that it could create a stigma that those true small businesses who are operating on online marketplaces, if they're now not listing their, their email address or phone number because they're just starting up and don't have a business address, this could inadvertently hurt them as well. But again, happy to follow up more with you um, after this meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, because I, in case you haven't noticed, I'm, as I said before, the businesses owned by uh, the majority of the population, including Amazon, um, $3,000 is like saying, can you buy me a case of Cokes? Uh, but you're a small business person, that may be all they have. So uh, please follow up with me. And I'm going to ask if you will uh, work with the sponsor uh, to see if she can address any of those, uh, any of those questions. And um, uh, I will apologize beforehand to anyone who may be in opposition that has not heard me ask this before. But, but I thought about it when Mr. Walker talked about uh, small businesses. And we certainly have got to make sure that we're protecting small businesses um, but we also have to make sure we're looking out for the uh, small BIPOC businesses. So thank you so much. So um, get with um, get with my LA and let's talk, okay? Will do, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, you may resume. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Joe Hardy. Vice Chair Neal, do you have something? This is Hardy. Okay. I think we're all interested in those questions. Thank you. I, I, yeah, and I, I, I apologize you, Senator Neal, and anyone else that I didn't think of that earlier, um, but it will weigh heavily on at least my decision. So broadcast, you may re resume those who are in opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Caller with a last three digits of 070. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Cameron Dimitri, Dimitri, D-E-M-E-T-R-E, -E -E, and I'm the Executive Director at TechNet. TechNet's the national bipartisan network of tech CEOs and senior executives that promotes the growth of the innovation economy. We represent over 85 companies and 3.5 million customers. While we appreciate the ongoing conversations with the author's office, TechNet respectfully opposes SB 314. The intent of the bill is aimed at protecting consumers from illegal, stolen, or counterfeit goods. However, SB 314 would hurt small businesses and individual sellers and create privacy risks. Online marketplaces are already heavily invested in new technologies and processes that identify bad actors and remove them from their platforms. We believe the current bill is burdensome and unfair by treating all sellers as guilty until proven innocent, which will harm legitimate Nevada small sellers. This legislation would unfortunately hurt their ability to compete by creating an onerous, time-consuming process of verification that big box retailers would not have to deal with. As small businesses struggle to maintain profits yet continue to provide essential products to consumers during the COVID-19 pandemic, now would be an especially poor time to place an additional unnecessary regulation on them. The ability for Nevada small businesses and individual sellers to reach consumers would dwindle while large in-person retailers would remain largely unaffected. The bill would thus force online marketplaces to choose between increased that threats of liability or simply removing listings from Nevada small businesses, while again, no similar requirements are placed on those retailers. 
Related to privacy risks, SB 314 would force Nevadans to compromise private information in order to continue selling on online platforms, and those unwilling to divulge highly personal information would be forced to stop listing their products and lose essential revenue. The public could easily learn, for example, the home address of a grandmother in Sparks who makes and sells hand-knitted face masks, thus compromising her privacy. The open display of such personal information required of entrepreneurial Nevadans with innovative products and citizens monetizing their hobbies, among others, could potentially lead to a very dangerous situation. For these reasons, we are opposed to this measure. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, broadcast, is the caller still on? Uh, yes, he is, Chair. Okay, yeah. Um, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing for me that I just asked the gentleman from Amazon. Uh, there are some roadblocks and there are some things that you have identified that would hurt small businesses. Um, do me a favor, please contact um, Shelby, my LA, and I'd like, to, I'd like to see and hear what those are. Um, and I want to make sure that the sponsor of the bill is there as well. Okay. Um, thank you. And, and I, 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 yeah, I've mentioned BIPOC committees, I mean, uh, small businesses, um, but I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm writing down those people who I know, those businesses I know have had a tough time. And those include um, veteran owned businesses, those include uh, women owned businesses, those include anybody who's in the DBA category. Um, and the, imp the impact of the pandemic has, be has reverber reverberated throughout the world but there are there are some people who have suffered so severely that uh, the tremors of the earthquake are still being felt, and um, I really want to make sure that we're doing all we can for them. And that's nonpartisan. That's that's just trying to make sure we're doing the right thing for for people for whom don't have a voice. Okay. So please get with uh, please get with Shelby. I'd like to meet with you all as soon as possible. Okay. You may resume broadcast. Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 814. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. Edith Duarte, E-D-I-T-H-D-U-A-R-T-E with Strategies 360 today representing eBay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the sponsor for meeting uh, with the industry coalition last week. Uh, unfortunately, we still have to come in uh, opposition today. eBay is a mission-driven e-commerce platform that connects sellers with buyers across the globe. Our platform has been a lifeline for small businesses, especially during COVID. Um, and the 67,000 Nevada sellers that utilize the technology. We have expressed our concerns, and I'd just like to lay out um, some of them here today. Uh, trust and safety are, trust and safety on the site are paramount to the buyer and seller experience. We do not want stolen goods on our sites either. Unfortunately, the bill does not prevent organized retail crime, but instead would create burdensome policies that infer, unf unfairly disadvantaged small online businesses and favor the big box retailers. The threshold is also too low at 5,000 or 200 sales. Um, it would impact uh, the number of sellers on or decrease the number of sellers on our site by making it harder to use the marketplace and uh, make a living to subsidize their income. Annual verification of the expensive list of information for these sellers would also be challenging for even the most established online marketplaces. The privacy risk is very concerning and the effect that it'll have on e-commerce, um, the extensive collection and disclosure of personally identifiable information, I think can be uh, very risky for some members in our community. Um, our company is also a, has a longstanding commitment to both consumer rights and owner protection. We use technological tools, processes, and personnel to prevent prohibited items from being listed on our platform or expeditiously removing any items not allowed. We've partnered with retailers, with brands, with regulators. We've implemented policies, and we worked with law enforcement 
and our Attorney General's Consumer Protection Bureau to enforce our policies, find and remove these actors who are unlawfully using our marketplace. But for these reasons, uh, we must still respectfully oppose SB 314. We want to work with the sponsor. Um, definitely looking forward to working with Senator Neal on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Thank and you, caller. I'm, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that I've asked the previous callers. Everyone has spoken, and I don't know, maybe the other committee members can discern that, but it's been in vague terms about this will hurt, this will hurt, but nobody's given me any examples. Uh, and also, what does this mean to um, small BIPOC and DBA businesses? Um, so please get with, uh, get with Shelby. We'll set up a meeting very soon uh, with all interested parties, along with the bill sponsor. And um, Vice Chair Neal, I hope you will invite Mr. Walker and anyone else that uh, needs to be there so we can iron out these questions. My biggest concern right now, in case you haven't noticed, my biggest concern right now is how lack of this type of transparency has hurt and will hurt small BIPOC DBA um, businesses. That's my biggest concern right now. And I think that some of the, some of the information that is required by this bill uh, is probably the same information that's required on a 1099, but we can go through that when we meet. Um, continue broadcast. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Currently, we are in opposition of SB 314. To testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers left in opposition at this time. Thank you. So we'll go now to those who are testifying neutral. 15 minutes, to three minutes apart. Sorry, Chair. To testify neutral on SB 314, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify neutral on SB 314, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 407, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Thank you. This is Randy Thompson, State Director, National Federation of Independent Business. I heard my name kicked around, so I thought I'd better call in. <laughs> I am in neutral on this bill, but I will definitely be meeting with Mr. Walker to discuss any implications to small business, um, as well as meet with the sponsor to uh, discuss um, <clears throat> any issues we might have with small business. Chair, you have no more callers left neutral at this time. Thank you. Um, so we'll go back to committee members. Are there any additional questions or comments? Thank you. I, I just want to say this. Uh, several of you all um, on both sides of this issue have met with me previously. And um, during our conversations, when you were explaining to me why you were in support or why you would be in opposition, um, it did not occur to me until Mr. Walker mentioned small businesses that this may be something that would help them. Um, back in August of 2020, um, the legislature, uh, both houses, and the governor issued a proclamation uh, declaring that racism is a public health crisis. And it is my firm, my firm commitment that we cannot do business as usual during this session uh, and just look at everything prima facie. We've got to make sure we're going below the surface uh, to see how that impacts, uh, whether positively or negative, how it impacts um, small BIPOC businesses and DBA businesses. Uh, that's, a, that's a very big concern because larger businesses can recover $3,000. They may be able to recover $10,000, but to a small business person, mm-mm. That could be the difference between them making it or losing everything that they had in their life savings and or their retirement. So that is my primary concern. So those of you who I've asked to call uh, and um, make, a, make an appointment with Shelby, uh, just know that going in, my, my primary concern is what does this bill do to help or hurt uh, small businesses and what 
has the environment that we live in right now in this pandemic, what has happened to those businesses as a result of not having this legislation in place, okay? Uh, thanks a lot. Vice Chair Neal, you have any closing comments? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, so I, I have uh, put the olive branch out to the folks in opposition. Um, however, um, I, I feel like the general concept of the bill is, is very, it's important. Um, I also want to make sure that as we move to whatever the chair feels in her wisdom is the middle ground that I should find, that um, we, we, we recognize that um, if you're doing business in as an online retailer, there is some regulation that needs to occur, right? It's not, um, and, and, and that is parity because if a, if a brick and mortar store has to identify what's on their shelves and be an answer to a customer, it is the same behavior that we are requiring from an online seller. And so I don't think that that's a super stretch I think that that is basic consumer uh, protection is to be able to identify the good that you are selling that is from a third party that's being put on the platform. And so I don't know if Mr. Walker has any closing comments. Uh, Brian Walker with the Retail Association for the record. Um, thank you, Senator Neal. Um, I, I would just say we heard a lot about roadblocks and what Senate Bill 314 puts them up, but I, I think roadblocks is an interesting way of defining consumer protection. Uh, and what we're looking at is, is making sure that a level of transparency, uh, a de minimis level of transparency exists against all sellers um, who sell products into Nevada, whether they are brick and mortar um, or online. Um, I think we have done a lot to answer the privacy questions um, I think the chair, you are 100% correct that this information is what you would find on a 1099. Um, and so I don't believe that we're asking for um, anything that would make it more difficult for small businesses to comply. Uh, but what we are asking for is something that'll help our Nevada small businesses be able to thrive and to continue to grow. And we look forward to answering your concerns um, at that later meeting, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. And Vice Chair Neal, uh, the thing that I'm going to focus on when we meet and any type of middle ground uh, that we come to will be in favor of small BIPOC and D DBA businesses. We'll be in favor of that because as I said before, they're the ones that will have a very difficult time uh, adjusting. And many of them are probably the same ones who have been in business less than five years. Um, my focus is going to be on them. So anyone that I've asked to meet with me, please come prepared. Tell me how this will help or hurt um, those businesses, uh, not platitudes. I need specifics. Okay. So thank you. And, um, I think with that, we will close the hearing on Senate bill 314 and, uh, open the hearing on Senate bill 320 and Senator Neal, just before you get started, let me just say this again. And I think every committee that I've been in, whether it's chair or vice chair, I've said this, and I just need people to understand. For me, Senate Concurrent Resolution 1 was not just pretty words. It was not, it was not something that would look good or you know, be a good photo op. For me, we have recognized as a result of this pandemic that there are certain strains and strands of our society that we have accepted as normal, but they have impacted disproportionately BIPOC communities. And so everything that I do this session, and those of you that I met with before session, I said the same thing. Everything that I do this session, I'm going to be looking at all bills, all of my bills and any bills that come to this committee through the lens of do they help or hurt the people who have been disproportionately shut down and shut out? So that's my concern. That's my concern. It's nothing personal for or against anyone. That is my concern. We, we will not be back here until 2023. And if we don't address some of these things, the people that we're trying to help right now, they won't be able to make it. Senator Neal, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Good, good morning again. I'm here to present SB 320. 
which is uh, focused on third party uh, food delivery platforms. I'm just gonna jump right into the bill because we have a third bill from one of our members on the committee. Um, if once it's so I need you guys to reference the amendment that is in the exhibit. Uh, I did talk to the third party retailer, I mean, third party platforms. And this is this is pretty much the amendment that I feel um, is the best. When I created this bill, I went and looked at several different um, states or cities that had a third party ordinance. And, you know, Nevada is very specific and sometimes we're super unique. You never want to take cookie cutter language that uh, maybe was in Chicago or Rhode Island, but you want to try to build a bill that reflects uh, what's going on in Nevada. So I took various parts uh, from other places and, and placed it in. The commission language that is in the bill that is highly contentious um, if the members would like to see it, I took it directly from the city of Chicago that had passed an uh, ordinance to deal with the commission language. And although I have struck out portions of that in the bill, I wanted to let the committee know that um, I didn't I didn't manufacture that language out of the sky. I pulled it directly from a city that is very dense and extremely populated where they had um, enforce this provision. So if you look at sections two, three, four, and five, those are all definitions. Um, six is also, section six is also a definition about food dispensing establishment. Seven is uh, discusses food price and section eight discusses likeness and identified symbol. Um, and this is super important because the bill deals with menu stealing. It has three parts, menu stealing, transparency of the receipt, and then the commission language. Uh, section eight, section nine is the online food order. Section 10 is the total online food price. Section 11 uh, defines what is a user. Section 12 uh, defines, uh, basically spells out uh, that if a food delivery service platform Provider shall not facilitate an online order involving uh, food dispensing, um, et cetera, et cetera, unless they have entered into a written agreement with the food dispensing um, establishment that is especially authorized. The purpose of that language was to number one, prevent um, menu stealing, using the likeness of a restaurant without their permission. Um, this was an issue that has popped up during the pandemic. And I wanted to make sure that there was an agreement between the entities um, if they are using anything that is related to the intellectual property of a restaurant. Section 13 um, basically says that the food dispensing establishment at any time must submit a written request to the food service platform uh, to remove uh, any uh, item that was not agreed upon it also changed the time period because initially the language says immediately and there was a question of what is immediately. The amendment says within 48 hours, you must remove uh, this uh, food, to, this restaurant from the food delivery uh, platform if they have not agreed to it. It kicks into a penalty in sub three. I believe I pulled this from Rhode Island um, that basically a civil penalty will kick in uh, $500 a day for the violation. And the reason why I put that on there is because number one, if this is a business to business transaction, you shouldn't be taking a restaurant's uh, menu or their symbol, symbol or image and using it without their permission. And if you are doing that, then I feel that this is something that should derive a penalty because you are basically uh, misusing a restaurant's um, intellectual property for your own benefit. So in section 14, um, it just spells out that uh, a food delivery platform should not or shall not use the likeness, register trademark, intellectual property. Um, section 15 continues to go forward with that and puts a increased fine 
uh, 5,000 for actual damages. Um, 16 is the transparency part of the bill, which lays out what we want to get from a food delivery service platform and what they must disclose in an open and plain way. Uh, the price of the food, um, sales tax, delivery fee or service, any gratuity. And this is where we get into the commission, which was amended, um, which then focuses on the aggregate food purchase. Um, that should also be on the receipt. Uh, the reason why we did that, if anybody has tried to uh, buy food uh, during this pandemic, what you see happening going on is that you might start off with a $30 order, and then by the time you click checkout, you have risen up to roughly $60 in order to get food that you thought was potentially minus, you know, tax that maybe you thought was going to be $37 or $38. This just allows the transparency um, for this um, for this actual food that you are going to be purchasing, and then it places a cap on the actual fees up to uh, 20%, but it ends when the emergency order by the governor ends. The argument that was presented to me by the third party uh, platforms was that, you know, there's a free market at play. You don't want the cap to go beyond uh, the pandemic. I agreed with the free market concept that, you know, the cap should only be a part of the window um, related to the pandemic and the emergency where individuals were trapped in their home, could not go out or didn't want to go out to uh, buy food or sit in a restaurant because the restaurants were no longer at, you know, 100% capacity. They were at, 50, you know, 25% capacity. And so the uh, third party delivery expanded in a significant way. Um, the amendment at the back uh, which excludes the grocery store, or convenience store. This was what the Restaurant Association um, included because the third party delivery persons felt that we were including grocery stores. That was not our intent um, to uh, attach them into this legislation. I do have uh, Alexandria on the line from the Restaurant Association. She is co-presenting with me. I wanted her to go deeper dive into the menu. Um, and also she has, there's a third person on the line who will get into other parts of the bill because they have experienced it firsthand. And I wanted them to be able to break it down in real time of what those provisions mean so Alexandria, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Neal, Chair, and members of the committee for having me testify before you today. Uh, for the record, my name is Alexandria Dazlich, and I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Nevada Restaurant Association. I wanna thank Senator Neal for bringing this important restaurant issue to discussion today. The intent of SB 320 is to balance the power dynamic between restaurants and third-party delivery providers. For the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely limited indoor capacity and dining capacity and has resulted in artificial dependence on delivery, which hasn't given the market time to naturally adjust. To give you a bit of a context of the growth of the third-party delivery sector prior to the pandemic, third-party delivery made up around 5% of most operators' total business. For most, it now makes up to 15% or more. Through many of the COVID related restrictions, restaurants have become expected to use third party delivery providers or lose out on what little revenue they could make. It is in this forced reliance on delivery that the issues between restaurants and third party providers have worsened as dining capacity continued to be limited. During the pandemic, third party providers continued to charge restaurant operators up to 30% per order, in addition to the delivery costs to the customer. Our association worked with the Clark County Commission to pass an emergency order that temporarily caps delivery fees at 15% per order, which saved our operators thousands of dollars. However, the emergency ordinance was met with some pushback. Some of the third party delivery providers skirted the 15% delivery cap for months before complying, while others claimed the cap did not apply to them because they identify themselves as a marketing company and others added a new additional fee charging extra two, an extra $2 per order to customers. 
It was during our, our discussions with restaurants that other issues like menu stealing and billing transparency quickly became part of a bigger discussion at the county level. It then became our mission to pass legislation that would protect our restaurants statewide by supporting legislation that would provide billing transparency and prohibit menu stealing. Menu stealing is another major issue for restaurants that discover uh, the authorized use of their menu or logo on third party delivery websites and applications. There have been instances where third parties have posted outdated menus, incorrect business hours, or inflated prices, sometimes using stock images that don't accurately portray the restaurant's dishes. Uh, in addition, there have been many instances of botched orders, either due to human error or because the dish is no longer available or requires uh, further specification. Uh, which often results in food being delivered late, cold, or not what they ordered. And when these problems occur, uh, customers often call the restaurant to complain. And this puts the restaurant in the unfortunate position of being blamed for mistakes that did not happen and they cannot fix. It is for these reasons that many restaurants intentionally chose to not partner with these services before the pandemic because they wanted to closely control the quality of the food and the takeout experience. These tech companies, which include third-party delivery providers, are part uh, of the new frontier that is exciting and makes our lives a lot easier. However, they come at a price of many restaurants if left unchecked. As big tech develops brand new sectors of the economy, rules and regulations are needed to protect our vital industries like restaurants. Common sense legislation like consent between restaurants and a third-party delivery provider as well as billing transparency that requires providers to disclose their price breakdown to educate restaurants and consumers as necessary as we move forward. Implementing these changes at the state level ensures that these practices are observed statewide. This uniformity is important to our operators who may have more than one location and do not have the means to adjust their business model for each restaurant location. If adopted, this legislation would provide a unified set of rules that is consistent and easy to follow. Since the beginning of the pandemic, more than 80% of our members have lost upwards of 70% of their normal revenue, while over 30% have closed permanently. We need, to, we need everything that we can do to help safeguard our restaurant industry, which has been devastated by the pandemic. I will now turn to Kristen Corral, who is the co-owner and operator of Tacotarian, which has multiple Southern Nevada locations and can speak to the issue of billing transparency. Ms. Corral, you're muted. Yeah, you're on mute. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. We good? Um, so I'll start over. <laughs> For the record, my name is Kristen Corral. I'm one of the owners of Tacotarian, a popular vegan, uh, vegan Mexican restaurant here in Las Vegas. Uh, we currently have two locations with plans to open two more by the end of the year. Fun fact, um, our Southwest location is in uh, Senator Scheibel's district and our New Henderson location is going to be in uh, Senator Pickard's district. Uh, we are also in the process of creating a food delivery co-op to combat some of the egregious and predatory practices that we are gonna discuss today. Uh, as a restaurant owner, um, and now accidental expert in predatory food delivery apps, I can tell you that the tactics used on a daily basis by these billion dollar tech companies are far from your average best practices. These tech giants are not working to help restaurants as they claim, it's actually quite the opposite. But with restaurants struggling to survive a global pandemic and delivery seemingly here to stay, we need to figure out how to begin to put some regulations on companies that currently answer to no one. Did you know that companies like Grubhub, DoorDash, and Uber aren't even required to carry a basic business license in most of our local jurisdictions in Nevada, with the exception of unincorporated Clark County? Um, why do billion dollar Silicon Valley companies can constantly get a pass that us small business owners are not afforded? Uh, currently, the, the average fee per order on the big three platforms is somewhere between 30 and 35%. And for most small businesses and especially BIPOC businesses, these are non-negotiable. Um, the national average for restaurant profits pre-pandemic is only four to 8%. When the pandemic hit, I worked with the county to pass a cap on those fees and keep them at 15%. That cap alone saved local restaurants thousands of dollars. Um, during the beginning of the pandemic, our Tacotarian Southwest location paid nearly $7,000 uh, in a few months in just 
third-party delivery fees. When you compare that to our rent, which is only $3,500, it seems rather daunting. Now we are lucky we run a very successful brand with a very loyal following, but for some small restaurants, they were forced to decide whether to pay mobster type billionaires or pay their rent. Most customers have no idea what fees are being imposed on restaurants or themselves, which is why billing transparency is so important. Um, when Tacotarian started putting out content via social media about how, the, how much these delivery apps were charging us, most of our customers were very upset. They knew they were paying a little more, but they didn't know how much more, and that they didn't know that the restaurants were being charged at all. In fact, many restaurants don't even know what they're being charged. There is no clear breakdown on the restaurant side either. We are constantly seeing fees added without transparency on what we pay. It seems transparency is a hot button issue today, but I can't figure out why. When you go to the grocery store, you purchase your groceries and you get a receipt with every fee that is charged. Why shouldn't third party delivery apps have that same transparency that every other store, restaurant and business has? This is not proprietary information. It's actually backdoor price fixing. If you wanted to create a free and fair market, like everyone keeps discussing, the apps would need to compete on the customer level. Competitive pricing is what capitalism is built on. I know regulating these silicone companies feels new and therefore like uncharted territory, but we have to put common sense laws in place to protect our small businesses. We at Tacotarian are starting our own food delivery co-op and we have hundreds of restaurants signed up on the platform before we've even begin to start. So you could say I'm in the same boat as Grubhub, DoorDash and Uber. I'm technically one of them offering the same services, but as a community co-op. Yet I'm not standing here in support with them. In I mean, I'm not standing here in opposition with them. I'm speaking in support because I know when you operate with ethics and integrity, there's simply nothing to hide. So I urge you to support this bill. Please choose local restaurants like mine over Silicon Valley, restaurants that are the lifeblood of Nevada and people who invested their life savings into our restaurants. Let's work together to raise up local businesses and put common sense food delivery regulations in place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, that concludes our presenters and we can open ourselves up, the three of us, to answer questions on the bill. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands up. Oh, yes, I do. Senator Pickard. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. You should always look at me, I suppose. Uh, I always have a question or two. So reliable, so yes, reliable. I, I try. I watch by it. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Um, uh, first, uh, let me say I'm sympathetic to the uh, desire, particularly towards transparency. Uh, as has been stated thousands of times, sunlight uh, is a great disinfectant. I heard it this morning. Um, uh, but I, I, while I, I appreciate particularly uh, Ms. Corral's uh, presentation, um, I think that uh, it's a little inapposite. I don't believe that uh, much of the information, uh, particularly in the level of detail that's required in the bill, uh, is uh, is uh, that, that it's not proprietary. I believe it is. Uh, to use that example, uh, grocery stores, um, uh, they don't put the cost of goods sold. They don't put their, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the shipping charges and things that uh, we would normally see uh, uh, in this bill. Um, uh, so uh, I, I, let me ask this first. Um, uh, does... Uh, um, uh, you know, when, when we talk about, uh, I'm, I'm looking at section three, uh, sub three, um, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at a, a marketing or uh, does the food delivery service provider charge these outfits for advertising on their space? Senator Pickard, uh, for the record, Alexander Daslich with the Nevada Restaurant Association. Uh, they do charge for advertising. That is usually an additional cost that the restaurant can opt into. All right, but uh, they're not forced to pay that. That would be if they want to uh, publish uh, an ad on the uh, uh, on the site, they may choose to do so. Do I understand that correctly? That is correct. All right, thank you. And then uh, looking at section 14, uh, the uh, misappropriation of, of a trademark um, isn't, I mean, that's already illegal per uh, federal and state law. You can't misappropriate someone's image or likeness, whether they're a person or a business. Um, uh, uh, why do we add this uh, penalty to existing law? 
Thank you for that. So the reason why we added this is because it's my understanding that in regards to the on the third party um, food delivery, that this is not a direct application to them. Um, I, when I spoke with legal about drafting this bill, they seemed to fall out of, and we needed to make sure that there was a specific designation that they were brought into our statute um, under that. That was my understanding. All right, perfect. Okay, that answers that one well. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand uh, um, uh, why we're, we're um, uh, and I was told that the amendment, although I'm not following it, I don't not finding it rather, uh, remove the private right of action in section 15. I think that's uh, probably a good idea to allow that rather than uh, delete it, but uh, I'll skip over that. Um, and then uh, um, uh, can you, I, I'm looking at uh, 16, section 16. Um, it, 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 this is, I think, You're muted. Sorry, um, not sure how that happened. I'm not sure how much you you heard. Um, did anyway? Um, I'm looking at section 16. Um, oh, I probably hit my space bar. Um, and I'm looking specifically at the uh, fee charged uh, to the user by the uh, FDSP uh, to deliver the material of the food. And then um, the gratuity, which I thought was interesting because gratuity, uh, I know even uh, some restaurants will add a gratuity. Uh, I object to it. I always scratch that out when they do um, uh, because that's up to me, the buyer. Uh, and then, uh, it, but so I'm not opposed to that, but then the commission associated that what the uh, online, uh, what the restaurant is paying uh, I view this as, you know, cost of goods sold. Uh, this is a, uh, this is proprietary. And by publishing this, aren't we putting uh, each of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the the platforms in a position of giving out all their information, their, their uh, uh, cost information to their competitors, and thus they lose uh, any competitive advantage that they may get, whether it's through uh, volume pricing, and I know that favors the chain stores. Uh, you know they'll be able to buy in larger bulk and maybe get a, a better price. But don't we disadvantage the businesses and their ability to uh, negotiate a better price? So uh, before, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Pickard. Um, and then I'm going to have Alexandria address. But I do want to make sure that we put this in the record for the amendment. The amendment is in the exhibit. It did come in late um, yesterday, but if you go to lines um, in section 16 sub C, where it references section 17, um, in section 17, all of, uh, well, majority of section 17 is struck out from uh, section 17 uh, sub two A, A, B, three A, and 3B, that is struck out. The green language that is added into the amendment, um, which is now part of the section. So remove section and then go to section 16 uh, sub D, where basically it says a statement that indicates that a commission is to be paid by the food dispensing establishment in connection with the online food order including a disclosure of the commission expressed as a percentage of the aggregate food purchase price on the deliveries by the food delivery service platform. And I also want to reiterate that um, grocery stores are not included in this legislation. We had no interest in um, including um, grocery stores. So they are not in or a convenience store. But I will have uh, Alexandria uh, explain the aggregate because this was our compromise. Um, Alexandria? Sure. Uh, for the record, Alexandria Dazzles with the Nevada Restaurant Association. Uh, so when the bill was uh, originally introduced, we wanted to include a breakdown of costs uh, regarding the amount of 
that the restaurant would pay per order. Um, after speaking to the third party providers, we understood that that was something that was a, a big ask, especially because it was um, you know, computing systems kind of talking to each other on a per order basis, that's a big ask. Um, and so we uh, spoke about the idea of making an aggregate um, number, coming up with an aggregate number, so that on that, uh, that receipt, it would include everything that you would usually include, which is the price of food, the tax associated, you could include, you know, the, the amount that was tipped to the driver, whether or not they decided to tip, and then you know, how much the restaurant is paid on average or has to pay on average. Um, I don't think we're asking for proprietary trade secrets. I think we're just asking them for clarification of posting what they charge for restaurants um, so that the public's aware uh, when they use a third party, um, it oftentimes isn't in the best interest of the small and independent restaurants. And uh, like you said, Senator Pickard, they don't have that negotiating power. I think that's part of the education that consumers aren't even aware of. I know Kristen's dealt with a lot of education in regards to uh, dealing with these tech companies because it's such an easy one, one stop, one click. Uh, they don't realize that, uh, you know, they're double, double billing essentially. Not only are they charging the consumer a delivery fee, uh, but they're also charging the restaurant an exorbitant amount, 30% per order is absolutely rid ridiculous. You know, our restaurants aren't even making money per order. And, you know, in a time where they're they're limited in, for indoor capacity, it's just, it's not even feasible to use them, yet everyone expects to use them or the delivery provider or delivery drivers, I should say, show up um, and they basically, you know, are menu stealing and saying, well, we have an order, you know, for this particular uh, customer and then they take it and then that's how they kind of get away with it. They skirt skirt around the whole issue of um, them even being able to, to consent and have a relationship uh, with that particular restaurant. So, you know, I think education with the consumer is vital to the survival of Nevada restaurants. And we need to understand this relationship or perhaps redefine the relationship with these big tech conglomerates um, so that consumers really understand that when they use their services, mom and pop restaurants operate at a loss. And I think that's really important to the education. I think by um, not disclosing those types of commissions, um, I think that's that will contribute to the closure of, of restaurants, especially during the pandemic. So uh, we don't see that as proprietary. We don't see that. We see that as helpful competition. Uh, competition. Um, if they're all you know, not disclosing their rates, then they get to control the market rate versus if they disclose their actual rates, um, which will you know, differ uh, depending on the restaurant. Um, then they would be forced to compete to offer the restaurants the best deal. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, neither do our restaurants. Um, what I do see is wrong is keeping the public and even restaurants in the dark about how they come up with what they charge um, and you know the fees associated with that. Sure, and and uh, I appreciate that response. I mean, of, of course, um, what uh, is uh, acceptable to one party is going could be acceptable or or considered proprietary by the other side. Um, uh, so, and I wouldn't expect you to find it uh, inappropriate since you're asking for this. I guess where I'm coming from is, you know, we're, we're at a level of detail that I think is proprietary personally. And I'm all for the small restaurants. I mean, that's usually who I go to. Um, uh, and, and so I, I just think, you know, if we were looking for transparency, a better response might, you know, and again, it's all where you draw the line. And I might draw the line to say, uh, to include 16B3 with D, and in other words, the, the 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 delivery charges plus the commissions, lump that all together and allow for some competition within uh, the industries. But Ms. Corral makes a great uh, point on this, and that's if the businesses don't want to use these services, they can uh, uh, band together and and create another option. That's exactly the kind of competition that we should be seeing. I just, I tend to resist uh, going too far. Um, uh, and, and, but anyway, I, I've taken enough time. I, I appreciate uh, your indulgence. Again, I'm not antagonistic to this idea. I just don't wanna go too far into uh, uh, what the, you know, I, I'm no expert in this business. I, I don't know what is and isn't their fair share, uh, which is another overused term in this building. Um, uh, we need to get into the, the details to the extent that we want to make sure we're not gouging, that we're not taking advantage, uh, particularly uh, uh, in this uh, uh, self-imposed uh, economic downturn. 
Um, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of consumer protection. I just think this may go a little too far. Anyway, so, thank you, Madam Chair. So just really quick, Senator Picker, have you where have you been able to I find the exhibit and Nellis, which shows the strikeouts? And I know that Ms. Corral had um, a comment. I was just yes, I did. I, I see that, and and um, uh, it, but it doesn't do away with the separation of the service delivery fee from the commission paid. Um, uh, and we're starting to get into the internal uh, um, financial, financial side of, of the business's operations. Uh, and, and maybe they can absorb it. Maybe they are gouging. Again, I don't know their business model. I don't know what it actually costs to deliver this service. Um, uh, but I do see the, the, the amendment. And I did want to bring something up, Ms. Corral, I'm going to go to you, is that the, when, when, when the third party uh, delivery entities argued against this, my question and my direct question was, how are you doing this in Chicago? Because if this, is, if this was direct language that I pulled from the city of Chicago, and I can give you the direct section um, and, and, and um, that is in their ordinance in, in entirety, then are you violating their law, right? Their ordinance and how how is it that the city of Chicago was able to get this passed at a local level, but then when we extract it here in the state of Nevada, you feel that, you know, it is, it is the wrong language and it is something that you cannot do. And so I always challenge entities when they say, um, you know, but not here, not in Nevada. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it in Rhode Island. I'll, I'll, I'll do it anywhere else, but just not here. And then, you know, because it begs the question of why are you fighting so hard to be unregulated and to not be under the same rules that other places have passed? The cap um, and the and the pieces in here, other other places have it. This is not a bill where I created um, language on on my own. I mixed and matched from other based on what I felt was um, happening in the Nevada landscape. And so, Ms. Corral, go ahead. Thank you, Kristen Corral from Secretarian for the record. I just wanted to quickly make the point that on the transparency that um, in my opinion, having that transparency on the back end isn't proprietary. They all know what each other is charging. They all get together and they have, you know, it's it's a well-known thing. They all know what each other is charging. They're all charging the exact same amount. So by by publishing those 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 fees, it's a giving customer education, but it's also giving restaurants um, negotiating power. And I feel that that's something that we don't have, especially um, minority and women owned businesses that are just operating small mom and pop shops. We have no negotiating power. Somebody like McDonald's can negotiate a 3% commission where we have no negotiating power. And I just feel like that, why shouldn't they have, why shouldn't they have to compete on the back end? Why should they, why shouldn't they have to compete to give restaurants the lowest fee? Um, it's still, a free and fair market, in my opinion, if they're competing on the back end. For the record, Alexander Dazlitz, I also just want to add a little statement. Um, Grubhub stock has doubled since this time last year. So just a little bit of context. Sure, and that makes a lot of sense because of the uh, situation we're in. They happen to be perfectly positioned to take care of a market that would have otherwise been underserved. Uh, you can say the same thing about many uh, businesses that uh, happen into a situation uh, that they didn't control, but they happen to be, you know, present and, and able. I want to be careful, though, that, uh, you know, we're not uh, um, accusing people of, of uh, illegal activity, uh, even if it's true, that's for the, the feds to decide. But I, I, I am sympathetic with the uh, impulse. Uh, I just think, uh, uh, anyway, I've taken enough time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Settlemeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. I very much appreciate the bill. Uh, one of my local restaurants in town, actually a couple of them now, had the problem where someone would take their menu, sadly, it was an old menu, and throw it up and then start trying to, you know, deliver for that particular business. And unfortunately, those prices were usually rather old. Uh, simply put, through the COVID crisis, you know, unfortunately, costs have gone up. 
And so it's created them a lot of problems. So you'll get a situation where a, a restaurant is in an argument now with a customer because something was done in the middle by an intermediary, and that's a problem. So I, I greatly appreciate the bill coming about. Why did you necessarily get rid of the delis in the supermarkets? And I ask that because the ones in my communities actually have food that you can go in and you can you know, get a sandwich made or they have pre-made foods that you can actually get and then take home. So what would happen to a grub pub driver if they you know, did that, if they're left out of this bill? I was kind of curious. I'll let Alexandria address that one. Okay. For the record, Alexander Dazzle for the Nevada Restaurant Association. Uh, so the, the thought behind the grocery stores is that, that that's not really, um, uh, we, we're kind of dealing with, with small independent restaurants, not necessarily in conjunction with um, retail and grocery stores. Uh, certainly something that we would be open to, uh, you know, for in further discussions, but uh, we were just trying to kind of control, um, you know, a smaller portion of the market, at least just dealing with restaurants that are, you know, independent and, and acting on their own. Okay. Uh, the discussion about the written notification, I agree with that, but I hope it can be made, you know, what's the legislative intent as far as the degree of specificity of that written contract? Are we talking about, you know, I don't want to get in a situation where sadly we put the small independent business, smaller businesses out of the running because it ends up being a, you know, 10 page document versus just being able to have the owner or the person in charge. And I hope that's what we're going to get on the record that it's not only just the owner but let's say the head manager has the right to update to the newer menu and sign off on the top of it you know date and time and all that with just enough specificity to make it qualify as a consent probably more so than a written agreement so that that way we don't require only the larger restaurants would have the benefit of running it through their legal team where the smaller mom and pops don't necessarily have that Thank you for the question, Senator Settlemeyer. You're referencing section 12. So the insertion of the word written versus agreement, leaving it broad, um, was actually a request by the third party uh, food delivery entities. Um, uh, more specifically, I believe it was Grubhub um, who asked us to insert the word written when they gave us some of their uh, selected changes that they would like for us to do and we adopted it trying to be um, uh, act in, in good faith that they we were not talking and and accepting their changes so I think that might be a question why why did they want that because we just basically had the agreement which would have allowed you know parties to decide you know what was going to be in and out um, but that is how that language got there trying to work with the folks in opposition. Okay, and then the last aspect, I appreciate getting after the fees, but I, I assume we're not getting into the details. I mean, clearly, we're, I hope we're only trying to really get after the, um, you know, what's the commission being charged for delivery? You know, because if they decide to advertise on the platform, I don't necessarily see why that type of information needs to be out there for everybody else. That's something, you know, businesses agreed to do or not to do. In that respect, are we are aiming, aiming mainly at those commission starts for delivery? Or are we trying to get other information as well, like the, you know, credit card fees and things of like that? I mean, to me, that should all be outside of the overall price, because even the state of Nevada, if you go use a DMV kiosk, you end up paying a credit card fee, unfortunately, and on top of the convenience fee. I'll let Alexandria address that. For the record, Alexander Daslich with the Nevada Restaurant Association. Uh, that is correct, uh, Senator Settlemeyer. Uh, we don't intend to include, again, all of the proprietary information um, in a, you know, that, that would require you know, an additional cost. If a restaurant chooses to uh, opt into additional advertising or marketing, uh, we, don't, we would not disclose that type of information, nor, that, nor do we care to capture that type of information. It's more for the purpose of educating the public as well as having under restaurants understand, you know, this is how much we're getting you know, charged for commission. It really is more of an outward facing document so that the consumer knows. And um, you know, I just wanna also point out that uh, this is not an instance of, of price gouging. Uh, they are not doing anything illegal. Um, so I do wanna be clear about that. Uh, and they have come to the table and have tried to negotiate with us openly. So that is something that I, I do wanna say on record. Um, however, you know, the, the thought behind you know, more billing transparency 
is because we've had such an issue, again, at the Clark County level um, in them getting around caps and ordinances that have been passed in other states um, that are even more stringent than billing transparency. Uh, Senator Neal had mentioned the city of Chicago um, and their implementation of billing transparency that's even more stringent than what we're proposing. That's down to a specific order that the restaurant needs to demonstrate the commission um, per order, like I'd mentioned. So um, they're not even complying with that. I mean, we had tested that and, and ordered some orders from Chicago, the city of Chicago within that, that area. And some of the providers are just not disclosing any of the pricing information. So again, it's an issue of compliance. It's an issue of holding people accountable. Uh, it's an issue of educating people. I think there's a big kind of mysterious cloud around what tech does how they come up with their, their their prices, but this isn't something like it's you know it's it's an Amazon or something that you know is in a warehouse. These are affecting restaurant operators who, at the end of the day, have to make payroll, keep their doors open. Um, so you know, while some people think it's proprietary, I think it's something that's necessary so that people say you know look, everything that's usually included on a receipt is included in terms of the price, the sales tax. You know, if you want to include the tip, wonderful. Um, but then also the commission. I think that's something that going forward we should consider uh, should be a part of, of the disclosure. Um, understanding and just having an idea of, okay, well, you know, somebody's paying for it and I'm paying a delivery fee. Not understanding that the restaurant is suffering from this um, is really what we're trying to get after here, especially after the pandemic. We have the cap of 20% that we're hoping to um, get past for the remainder of the um, emergency in effect. And that's great. But what do we do after that? Now we're going to go back to what it was before the pandemic, which is 30 to 35 percent. Again, for small independent restaurants, there's going to be absolutely no disclosure. There's going to be no transparency. So like Kristen had mentioned earlier, this is a way for small independent restaurants to fight back and at least shop around and say, look, I'm getting this particular deal. Maybe I can get a better deal somewhere else, uh, as well as the, the customer saying, man, I ordered a five dollar burger and I'm getting charged. $40. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And so they understand where does that come from? Because they think, oh, well, I, I paid the delivery fee. Maybe that's just part of it. No, it's actually part of the education of the restaurant is, is getting footed with the majority of the bill. So that's why we think it's really important. Um, it's something that, you know, we feel really passionate about. And a lot of our operators have come out in support and are finally saying, you, you guys are finally addressing things that, you know, have, have always been an issue, but now, you know, uh, the pandemic's kind of exacerbated it. So um, we're certainly open to working and amending things, but we just want to make sure that restaurants have a voice here. Greatly appreciate it. I, I really much appreciate the bill too. Again, I've had situations where I have constituents and restaurant owners, businesses, small mom and pops that are getting at odds with one another and they don't have to be. And it's all because of an outside source. So I, I very much appreciate many of the aspects of the bill. Last question, which is probably more of a question for, you know, drafting section 19. Why are we deleting the term honorable speed to a lot? For the record, Alexander Daslich from the Nevada Restaurant Association. Uh, the thought behind that was in, if, if there's an existing or future emergency order um, and indoor capacity is limited, then we would also be able to continue that 20% cap in the future. Thank okay, I, I appreciate and agree with the leash of that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, I don't see any more questions. So why don't we go now to um, phone lines, broadcast, and we will start <clears throat> with um, those in support and let's do uh, 15 minutes, three minutes per. Um, and I want us to try to stick to that timeline because I'm looking at um, the clock and we'll probably be past floor, but I don't, floor time, but I don't want to be much past floor time because there's some people who set their schedules by the time um, that they see the floor is going to convene um, online. So broadcast. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 320, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 781, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. 
Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Nick Vanderpool, N-I-C-K-V-A-N-D-E-R-P-O-E-L with Capital Partners, today representing the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce, here to here today to support Senate Bill 3, 320. The Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce and some of its restaurant members have seen the pros and cons of third-party platforms, which the Nevada Restaurant Association outlined. This legislation is a step in the right direction that provides consumer protections with the with the building transparency. Nevada restaurants are part of Nevada's economic backbone, and we believe this is a common sense compromise which benefits all parties involved. We again appreciate Senator Neal for this legislation and urge your support. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 700, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Brian Wachter, B-R-Y-A-N-W-A-C-H-T-E-R, on behalf of the Retail Association of Nevada. We are in strong favor of Senate Bill 320. Uh, we believe that our restaurants in Nevada play a vital and important role in the foundation of our economy. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of Nevadans still out of work and in a hospitality industry that is struggling to rebuild um, in a situation that is abundant with uncertainty. Uh, we believe that the transparency found in Senate Bill 320 will provide um, our small restaurants with the ability uh, to be able to negotiate, um, as well as educate the public on how third-party marketplaces uh, work um, so that they are more educated um, when they are purchasing items um, and getting their dinner from, from these platforms. Uh, we believe that the goal of this legislature should be to return our job force to its pre-COVID condition, um, and to do that, we'll get Nevadans back to work of all stripes. Um, and so for those reasons, we are in support of Senate Bill 320, and we urge your support as well. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 705. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 705, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm actually uh, in opposition. I think this was left over from the previous item when I was trying to speak, so I can wait. Okay, thank you. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Vegas Chamber. We appreciate the bill sponsor for bringing this bill forward and working with uh, stakeholders on this important piece of legislation. The Vegas Chamber is in support of SB 320 as we have many small business members that would be impacted. As you know, our small businesses include restaurants, which many times are small family-owned businesses. Uh, our restaurant members, as many of you are aware of, have been hit hard during the pandemic. They've had to significantly shift their business model as they have struggled to stay open and keep Nevada's working in the industry during this pandemic. As of today, our restaurant members still are operating under state directives with limited capacity of up to 50%. They've had to operate under restrictions for over the last year as they did their part to slow the spread of COVID-19. We need to support these small family-owned restaurants, especially those that are women and, and those that are women and minority-owned businesses. We believe that this bill brings important parity and transparency to the issue, and as you've heard today, between the restaurants and third-party delivery platform companies. We ask you for your support for, on behalf of Nevada small businesses. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 407, excuse me. Please slowly spill and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Hi, this is Randy Thompson, R-A-N-D-I-E-H-O-M-P-S-O-N, -E State Director of the National Federation of Independent Business, speaking today in favor of SB 320. I have an email from a restaurant owner named Jeff Eckert in Las Vegas, and he said that the revenues this year were very similar to last year, but the problem with this scenario is that they paid between 26 to 38% through delivery companies. 
When the bulk of your business is delivery, you end up with higher revenue but much less profit. Delivery is mainly for name recognition and marketing. It is not a significant profit generator. So we are uh, in support of this bill. I have many small locally owned, family owned mom and pop restaurants around Nevada who are still struggling. And SB 320 will adjust the relationships between the third party delivery providers and those small independent restaurants that are so valuable to our community. It's what makes our community and it allow them to have more transparency and more accountability. Uh, I appreciate the sponsor bringing this bill forward and thank you very much. We stay in support of 320. Thank you. If you recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 320. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers left in support at this time. All right, so let's go to uh, opposition. To testify in opposition of SB 320, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 096. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 096, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Thank you, please begin. Good morning, Chair and Vice Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for your time today. My name is Hannah Smith, and I'm the head of government relations for the Western United States at Grubhub. We currently oppose this bill, but are in active conversations with the bill sponsor, committee members, and the Nevada Restaurant Association, and are hopeful that we can find a path forward. At Grubhub, we appreciate the state of Nevada's commitment to supporting restaurants that are the lifeblood of cities and neighborhoods across the state. This is a commitment that we share and has been at the heart of our work since we were founded in 2004. And I particularly want to thank the Nevada Restaurant Association for their tireless support of the state's restaurants and delivering with dignity, a local Nevada organization that works with local restaurants and nonprofits to deliver food to those in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. Grubhub is proud to have partnered with Delivering with Dignity through our Grubhub Community Relief Fund. First, there is one provision of the bill that we stand strongly in support of, the ban on restaurants being included on third-party apps without a formal agreement. At Grubhub, we began using this business practice to keep up with competitors who have done it for years. We strongly support ending this practice and are working on national legislation that would require all companies to play by the same rules. Unfortunately, there are two problematic provisions of SB 320 that we would also like to discuss. As currently drafted, the bill requires companies like Grubhub to disclose the terms of the contract between our restaurant partners and Grubhub. These amounts vary depending on the services selected by each restaurant owner and are set in a private contract. Requiring the disclosure of that private information would hurt restaurants competitively and is akin to having grocery stores disclose how much they paid for produce prior to having their customers check out. For diners, we disclose every fee consumers pay clearly prior to checkout and on their receipt, which is consistent with our longstanding commitment to transparency and also protects the privacy and competitiveness of the restaurants who choose to partner with Grubhub. The bill also institutes a 20% commission cap on every independent restaurant in Nevada. We are concerned about the unintended and damaging consequences of fee caps. While well-intentioned, they limit how restaurants, especially small and independent establishments, can effectively market themselves to drive demand. Grubhub provides critical marketing services that have hard costs, which let local independent restaurants compete with large chains that have significant marketing budgets. When a cap is set so low that a third-party company can't even offer a basic level of marketing support, thousands of restaurants across Nevada, particularly in rural parts of the state, are placed at a distinct competitive disadvantage with national chains. In other jurisdictions where fee caps have been implemented, we have seen a clear effect of caps lowering how customers and uh, how many customers they receive and the orders that restaurants receive, in which turn lowers revenue for drivers by reducing the number of orders that can be delivered. And finally, we have heard from experts about what is needed next. The National Restaurant Association's recent blueprint for state and local restaurant recovery includes detailed steps lawmakers can take to support restaurants, including safeguarding tax treatment to prevent unforeseen liability for federal relief funds, establishing grants, and providing property tax relief. What you will not find in there is any argument for fee caps or private contract disclosure as policies that effectively support restaurants and their emergence from the pandemic. We urge you to reject these provisions, and we are hopeful to find a solution that will deliver the support restaurants need. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, caller. And Chair, might caller I ask with... a question for her? Senator Pickard? Yeah, I'm just, I'm interested if she's still on the line, I'd just like to ask for her to respond to the uh, uh, claim, uh, which I uh, am sympathetic to, that uh, 38 to, or 25 to 38% uh, seems unreasonable. Uh, I'd like her to address that if she's still on the line. Yeah, and, and we'll, try to, we'll try to make it short. We are, we are the last morning committee and we're still in and it's gonna bump us up two floors. So um, please, please, you asked the question. And so if you can be succinct and then Senator Pickrick, if you can take that offline, it would be appreciated. Sure, I, Senator I, Pritchard, I, I'm still here. I'd be happy to follow up with you offline. All right, I just think that it's important to get that on the record uh, if we can. But, well, she uh, can respond. I just add, I just asked for brevity. Yep. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Just interested to see what your response is to the 25 to 38 uh, percent uh, markup that does seem uh, pretty unreasonable. Um, can you just uh, address that briefly? Yeah, certainly. Um, that is a high commission rate for, for what we see across our averages, but I think most importantly, they're not paying 28 to 35% for just delivery. Uh, they're paying 28 to 35% for, for a series of other services that include everything from marketing and advertising to loyalty programs to discounts on our app to, to AdWords searches and, and things of that sort. So it's more than just delivery there. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Moving to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 705. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Robert Callahan, C-A-L-L-A-H-A-N, and I'm with the Internet Association. We represent the nation's leading internet companies, and we are opposed to Senate Bill 320. Uh, we are opposed to the open-ended cap, cap on restaurant commissions as proposed in this bill. Uh, we do think such caps, regardless of their duration, will result in harmful consequences. And they also set a concerning policy precedent for the many other companies and industries uh, that have business-to-business -business contracts like these. Um, as has been mentioned by the previous speaker in opposition, these fees do cover a broad range of services. Um, and to the extent that these uh, commissions are capped, um, they could be uh, result in reduced supportive services for small restaurants, services that larger restaurants don't necessarily need. Um, and as has also been mentioned, uh, we have seen a drop in food orders, uh, which hurts not only restaurants, it hurts the drivers who are delivering uh, the food. Um, additionally, uh, we, you know, we have concerns over the disclosure piece and we look forward to reviewing uh, the new amendments um, that were provided today. Uh, but uh, there is, um, as has been mentioned, I think Senator Pickard had a number of questions on this. We do think there are some anti-competitive elements to it and also can be misleading for consumers uh, who do not understand the difference between services being received by the companies uh, and the actual uh, fees uh, that are showing up. So um, I know it's late, uh, but I would respectfully just want to uh, uh, submit our opposition to the bill, Senate Bill 320. Um, and also, Madam Chair, if I may, I had referenced earlier, I was trying to speak in opposition to the previous bill, um, and the system was not uh, allowing me to. So um, I can follow up with you at a later time on your concerns, because I did have specific comments on the previous bill as well. Again, Robert Callahan with the Internet Association. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Caller with the last three digits of 069. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Thank you, please begin. Good morning, my name is Rose McKinney James. M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y hyphen J-A-M-E-S. This morning, uh, representing Grubhub, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, uh, given the fact that my client has already offered some comments and in the interest of time, I think I will defer and allow others to speak. And if there's time remaining, 
uh, I will uh, offer some additional observations if that's acceptable. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 903, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning. This is Jennifer Lazovich, L-A-Z-O-V-I-C-H, on behalf of DoorDash. I'd like to start by saying we appreciate some of the changes made by Senator Neal in the amendment. However, we still remain opposed to certain sections of the bill. I was personally involved in the ordinance that was passed by Clark County. I would like to make it clear that no other jurisdiction in Southern Nevada chose to pass an ordinance mandata mandating a temporary cap on commission. DoorDash considers restaurants to be our partners. We want our restaurant partners to do well, which is why our contracts with restaurants are completely voluntary. They can be amended or canceled at any time. That was true before the pandemic, and that remained true during the pandemic. Additionally, we offer a number of marketing options, and I want to make clear that those are complete options on our platform that restaurants can either opt into or not. It is entirely their choice, but every restaurant has a contract with us that is unique. So um, in particular with Section 161D, which requires public disclosure of the percentage commission paid by a restaurant, we are requesting that this section be deleted. As I mentioned above, these are private contracts. We believe they are proprietary. And because our contracts are unique and individualized to each restaurant, um, whether it's their marketing options or delivery, they're combined into one commission and therefore we maintain and believe very strongly that they are private and should remain private. In section 14, while we agree that in order to take any kind of order or post uh, any menu, you absolutely should have written consent from a restaurant to be able to do that. However, we would offer that that section should be amended to at least allow some basic information about the restaurant. And what we mean by that is the restaurant's name, perhaps their address and phone number. The reason why we think that's important is it's another tool for people to find information about our restaurant partners the same way that they would on a basic Google search or even on Yelp. And finally, in section 19, we heard repeatedly that um, restaurants, because of the declaration of emergency and the reduced occupancies were forced to rely more so on delivery companies such as ours. Um, we would request that that section be amended to state that the cap will remain in effect until the declaration of emergency is lifted or a restaurant is allowed to return to a 100% occupancy level, whichever first occurs. If the restaurants can return to an occupancy level of 100% prior to the declaration of emergency being lifted, that is the number one thing that they've stated as to why they want to make sure there's a cap in place. But once they return back to 100% capacity, then that cap should be able to be lifted as well, even if it goes before uh, the declaration of emergency is lifted. Thank you for taking into consideration my comments today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 180, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. For the record, my name is Laura, L-A-U-R-A, -A, Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S. Good morning, my name is Laura Curtis and I'm the Government Relations Senior Manager for DoorDash. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Um, while we do appreciate Senator Neal making some changes to SB 320, we still remain opposed to certain portions of the bill as, um, Ms., as Jennifer mentioned, but our biggest concern is still with Section 161D, which requires a percentage disclosure of the commission charge to a restaurant by a third party delivery company. The commissions that are negotiated between a restaurant and DoorDash are private and should remain that way. The commission should not be mandated to be disclosed. And when restaurants choose to partner with DoorDash, they agree to pay fees, not just for delivery and pickup, but for a wide range of optional services, such as advertising and marketing. For example, some restaurants may pay a higher fee for marketing options to attract new customers or expand their existing delivery radius. Other restaurants may not want to pay for these options. All these fees restaurants pay are voluntary and confidential. Additionally, the information is highly competitive between food delivery companies. Um, and I'd also like to note that restaurants themselves set their menu prices on our application, and so they can set their menu prices and build in those commission costs if they want. 
Um, exposing this information would be the same thing as requiring a restaurant to put on their menu or receipt the cost breakdown of a burger, a percentage of how much was paid to the meat distributor for the burger, the bakery for the bun, and how much is paid to each worker. Using the language of SB 320, the restaurant would also need to disclose the name of the meat distributor or the bakery. Again, these are private contracts and should remain private between the parties. DoorDash has already committed to not adding new restaurants to our platform without consent, as this bill would require, and we support the other portions of Section 16, which require disclosures of other information, such as total online food order prices, sales tax delivery fees, and gratuities to be paid for the driver. Again, we do appreciate the amendments, but we would like to continue to discuss the amendments that we have proposed today, and we look forward to doing that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 626. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Uh, good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. For the record, this is Piper Overstreet, P-I-P-E-R-O-V-E-R-S-T-R-E-E-T. I'm with the Griffin Company and uh, testifying on behalf of Uber Eats today. We absolutely understand the intent of the bill as a temporary relief measure for the, for the restaurant industry, but there are two concerning components that remain. The first is section three concerning credit card processing fees. The vast majority of jurisdictions, including Clark County, that have passed uh, temporary COVID related commission caps have either initially excluded credit card processing fees or retroactively remove them. Platforms have no control over these fees. Um, the second um, concerning piece of language that remains in the amended bill is section 16 B3 and D around disclosures. And I know this has been addressed throughout the hearing, so I'll, I'll try to make it brief, but every restaurant that is paying commission, uh, that elected to pay a commission um, on our platform was elected to do so based on the needs of their business. This is an optional service with real operating costs associated with it. Food delivery is expensive, which is why many restaurants did not offer it before the advent of delivery platforms. The operators on our platform can opt out of the agreement at any time with no penalty. So I'd ask the question, do we require anything similar of other industries when it comes to their business to business contracts? Um, and is the attempt to fundamentally change, change this across the private sector? If not, then this, we feel this is singling out one type of business, which is, which is why you remain opposed. I certainly do want to thank the sponsor for working with us on other pieces of language in the bill as well as the restaurant association but uh, unfortunately we have to remain opposed based on uh, those pieces of remaining language thank you so much for your time today appreciate it chair you have no more callers left in opposition at this time thank you uh, let's go to neutral to testify neutral on SB 320, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 070, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have three minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Cameron Dimitri, D-E-M-E-T-R-E, -E, and I'm the Executive Director at TechNet. I actually had registered to, to be in opposition, so that's where my position is at. Is that okay if I continue? Hello? Is that okay if I continue in opposition? Did, did you call in for opposition? Yes. Yes, Chair. Okay. Okay. Please, please continue. Three minutes. Thank you, Chair. TechNet is the national bipartisan network of tech CEOs and senior executives that promotes the growth of the innovation economy and represents over 85 companies and 3.5 million customers. We respectfully oppose SB 320. Food delivery platforms have become crucial to restaurant and local businesses remaining open and continuing to generate much needed revenue. These are valuable partnerships that have enabled restaurants to reach new customers. And since COVID-19, our companies have provided tens of millions of dollars in direct restaurant support and have spent millions more providing free meals to healthcare workers, seniors, school children, and other vulnerable groups. Restaurant commissions cover a broad range of services made available to restaurants through our members' platforms. They're not 
one size fits all, but rather are tailored to each restaurant's needs. These restaurants are able to collaborate on marketing, determine the appropriate neighborhoods to open new locations and see how pricing affects consumers' demand. Commissions, <clears throat> commission and fees go a long way towards supporting delivery platforms' operational costs and ensuring workers are paid fairly. The operational costs covered by commission, commissions and fees include onboarding new delivery people, ensuring that delivery workers are paid fairly, maintaining safety, including insurance costs and providing PPE, tech services, including payment processes, order management, app maintenance, and dispatching tech. Commission caps would dramatically curtail the services offered by delivery platforms, making food ordering and delivery more expensive, potentially limiting access to food delivery to more rural parts of Nevada. This in turn would significantly reduce demand and limit restaurant revenues and earning opportunities. Delivery network companies are competing for restaurants business and offer a wide range of partnership structures and commission rates to suit restaurants needs. These fee structures are transparent and clear when any restaurant enters into a contractual partnership with de a delivery network company. And finally, we believe the disclosure requirements as others have outlined in the bill are deeply troublesome as they are private contracts between parties in a highly competitive market. With this said, our member companies are committed to using tech and innovation to spur local economies by making brick and mortar restaurants accessible at the touch of a button. For these reasons, we are opposed to this measure. Thank you for your time and consideration. For the record, my name is Kiri Moore, K-E-R-I-M-O-O-R-E. -E. I'm actually wanted to speak in support of the bill, if that's okay if I continue. Yes, ma'am. Three minutes. Uh, so my name, thank you. My name is Kiri Moore. I'm the marketing community manager for Think Food Group Restaurants, specifically Haleo by Jose Andres and China Poblano. And over the years, our two restaurants that is located in the cosmopolitan of Las Vegas have had their menus stolen and posted on third-party delivery service sites without our consent. We had to call or write letters to have our menus removed just to have them reappear on delivery sites after a few months. It should not be the burden of the restaurants to audit all third-party companies that we do not have written contracts with. The, rest, the relationship should be bound by a contract if they are to use our intellectual property. Without having regulations placed on the delivery services, our restaurants can lose reputational and quality control if they continue to offer our menus, which, as stated before, are mostly out of date without any permission. Our restaurants currently do not use any third-party delivery services now because uh, of our location on the Strip and within, uh, well, within a hotel. Yes, costs involved using these platforms are an issue, but for us, there are too many variables and timely steps involved in having our food delivered while keeping our quality standards in place. Bill SB 320 will allow Nevada restaurants to um, keep and control their brands in the delivery marketplace. Customers will have a clearer understanding on what they are paying for before placing orders. And third-party delivery services, I believe, will have an opportunity to work with more businesses that they may have mistrusted them in the past. Thank you. Chair, you have no more callers that are neutral at this time. Thank you. Um, Senator Neal, support, opposition, and neutral. Do you have any <clears throat> closing comments? Uh, no, Madam Chair. I, I want to say thank you for hearing this bill. And um, that's it. Thank you. And so with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 320. Uh, and we were going to hear another bill today, uh, Senator Lang, uh, but we ran out of time. So we will hear that first thing tomorrow. And uh, I'm just going to ask committee members to be mindful. We still have about 25 bills to hear. And if when you ask questions, if you can limit it to one um, while we're in the meeting and then take the others offline, um, if we don't get through get through our quota this week, 
uh, we only have next week and I'll be forced to cut some other bills that we will not have time to pursue. Uh, I'm trying, there are some that we didn't have uh, time to pursue that, and there are some other bills coming over from the assembly uh, that are duplicative. So um, we need to make sure that we're being judicious with our questions and the time so that uh, we can hear um, remaining bills. Uh, if we run out of time, then that's gonna be bad news for some people who wanted their bill to be heard. So please keep that in mind. And uh, we'll open it up now uh, for public comment. Thank you, Chair. To speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers for public comment at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will be back here tomorrow morning at eight o'clock and uh, just had a question from someone, why do we limit? We only meet once every two years and that's only for 120 days. And if you look at the number of bills that have been processed or have at least been um, written by our legal staff, we've got, um, I think it's north of 900, might be a thousand. So um, as chair, I try to be as fair um, and understanding as possible. I just know that with the number of bills that we have left, uh, if we continue to go at this rate and only process two bills per day, there are going to be a lot of bills that will not get a hearing. So with that, uh, we will adjourn and we will be back again tomorrow morning. Thank you. We are adjourned.